We had a lot of fun. We had a lot <laughs> right. of fun with him with this. <laughs> I a lot of fun. Did. I don't well, know see, why he would tell us that. Yeah, if you bring that up, you better be real open and comfortable right? to talk about a lot of stuff. <laughs> and he's not. That's what's funny about the deal, and it become a real topic. A lot of innuendos around here. Right. All right. Player introduction music. We'll be ready to go. <laughs> comfortable, Ollie. Welcome to the Big Honker Podcast, brought to you by Dive Bomb Industries. I'm Jeff Stanfield with the world famous Andy Shaver. Before we get into this, Andy, I got to ask you. Yeah, you still in on Kennedy? No, I'm yeah. out. His I, VP, I, his VP, lost it for you, huh? Yeah, I don't even know anything about the lady, but I'm out. I'm back to the. She's Trump a train. Silicon Valley lady. That's all I needed to know. Trump's made 1.5 billion dollars this morning. Did you see when the guy asked him how he was going to pay for his bail? Cash. Cash. Be a uh, meme before you know it. it. It was one. It's that uh, gangster one, whatever they have. Oh, it, really? Where they flip the glasses and have the cigar coming out. Yep. <laughs> also, today with us from Georgia, correct? That's correct. Mr. Greer Smith with 50 Ducks. How are you doing, sir? I'm wonderful. It's good to be here. Before we get into 50 Ducks, I want to ask you about one ship and one bridge. Anybody right. think that's an accident or do you think it's it's in, done? Because mm. I don't trust anything that happens anymore, so I don't know. Right. What do you think? Stuff no, a lot of conspiracy theories about out there, but I like to hope it was an accident. Whoever it is screwed up big time if it was an accident. That's for sure. I mean, I don't know much about the intricacies of a ship and a bridge and how it goes, but I would have thought there would be tugboats with it. Right. And if it went offline, I would have thought that, I, I don't know, I just thought there would be a safety net. My thing is, if it was a terrorist attack, why would they do it at 1 o'clock in the morning? I think that they're not worried about killing people as much as they are getting rid of all the uh the shipping channel oh. clogging it up i don't know because here, here's i read this a minute ago and i listened to some stuff this morning on it they will not let any heavy duty ships or anything with any kind of explosives nothing go across the chesapeake tunnel hmm. so they have oh, to go under that bridge they can't go the other way around because that when they built that tunnel on the other end of the chesapeake bay they done a tunnel and a bridge so the our, our military can get their boats in and out of the norfolk right Fit shipping yards. I don't know what it is. I saw it this morning. First thing I did was texted Stoner to make sure he was okay because he lives over there. And he texted me back at 6.15. He's like, what's going on? Yeah, I'm fine. What's ha what happened? <laughs> I said, uh, Francis Scott Key Bridge got knocked down last night by a ship. He goes, you got to be shitting me. And then he texted me back. He said, wow, that's bad. He goes, yeah. that is a very vital cog for transportation going into Baltimore. Right. I bet they have the uh, ship channel cleared within two weeks. That long? Oh well, yeah. You got to get that whole bridge out. I bet. I bet in two weeks they can have it cleared out. Where those people, I feel sorry for all those people wanting to work. If you've got, they said most all the vehicles that come into the United States from that that side mm -hmm. go to that place. Really? And then all the all the grain and fertilizer and any heavy machinery goes right. into that place at Baltimore. So it's going it's going to screw up a lot of things. A lot of people going to be without jobs, maybe. And I hate that. It was crazy. What were there? Six people? Six people killed? Is that all? I think that's what it was. Six or seven, yeah, it wasn't very many. I, that shocked me because I watched it, you know, at 530 this morning, I saw it, and I saw show, showed a truck going across a bridge, and I thought, that son bitch right there is sitting somewhere talking about how damn lucky he is. Oh, he was yeah. the last one off? You see that Brit, him going right across the bridge, yeah. and then it blew up, and then you saw another car went sliding back down it. But just, you know, thinking, you know, that it's kind of like that survivor's guilt people get it on a plane crash, the one person that lives. Right. The last guy that drove across that bridge ever. We were in upstate New York, and there's how long? It's a, it's a long bridge, but it connects uh, America to Canada, mm -hmm. and you got to go across it to, to for your port of entry. Oh, the Canada. Thousand Island Bridge. That thing, you're up, but I'm t new fear unlocked with this <laughs> thing. Like I'll never feel feel safe on a bridge. I think that's going to be standard for a lot of people. Yeah, the, I mean that's a long way down, that, and I mean that bridge scared you. Well, I mean, it didn't scare me, but you just get uneasy. The Mackinac Island Bridge is a lot worse than that. You just always think, like, what happens? Like, 
is this thing pressure test rated? Like, you know, how many cars can we fit on here? Well, the other day I, I had to, uh, we went to uh, the Bassmaster in Tulsa mm-hmm. and they had a thunderstorm in Wichita Falls. So <clears throat> right before you get on this big ramp, there's like this pool of water. So everybody's slowing down to go through the water. Well, like normally on this big bridge, like there might not be 10 cars, but everybody's kind of staggered. So you're getting more and more cars up here. And like it was almost bumper to bumper traffic when I was going across this bridge, and I was like, "Shit, did they did they engineer this yes. for this thing being full of cars?" <laughs> yes, they did. Full of cars. Yes, yes. Well, I hope so. I made it across, but I was ready to get off of that son of a bitch because I've never been on it with that many cars. What sucks is when you go across, like we drove through the Golden Gate Bridge. Right? Have you been Have you been there before? I have. It's a very it's a beautiful area. It's a shame right. what's happened to San Francisco. Certainly. But you can't see much because it's so damn freaking big. I mean, yeah. you can't. I was trying to drive on the side, you know, and Michelle's like trying to get pictures. And we went early, so I could almost stop on the bridge and even take a picture. But the Mackinac Bridge, have you been to Mackinac Island? Ever? That bridge has got grates on it. And I'm assuming it's engineering for either wind or for all the snow and ice. Yeah. But you can see down, that way, would, way, way down and drive across them grates. That would make me anxious. I was like, oh, shit. You know, the guy with the <gasps> cheapest bid built them grates, too. <laughs> The guy with the cheapest bid built that bridge. Too. Yes, he did. I'm sure he did. Yeah. We met a guy when we were on Mackinac Island that his job was to take pictures for him. And he has to go. That's all he does. He goes mm-hmm. once a month or once every two months and has to take pictures of every, all the welds and everything. Right. What he tells he makes 80000 a year. He made a lot of money. And that's all he does is go take pictures a couple times a month. he got to have an end with somebody in the government. Yeah. Well, I'm sure that's exactly that's where everybody else where everybody makes money. I don't give a shit if you paid me three hundred thousand. If you paid me a million dollars a year, I would not do that job. Why is that? I don't like heights. Dangling my fat ass on a cable underneath a bridge? Hell no. Can we get you some Xanax for me? I don't. I don't. <laughs> you could, you could put me on meth and cocaine and fentanyl. That's probably the wrong way. It don't. It don't matter. I'm not. There is no way in hell I'm doing that. There's no way. That's fair. Have you heard about those guys that changed the? Uh, Change the lights on top of the... Uh, Another job for a million dollars I wouldn't do. On the wind turbines? Well, not the wind turbines. The guys that do it on the on big the, old radio towers. Yeah, on the radio towers. Hell too. no. Yeah. They make a shitload. Of, I think they make six figures a year. That's what I've heard. Would, I, you know, it's would you do it? But I don't know. I think about it. I know Andy wouldn't do it. I could do it. Bullshit. I could do it. Give me enough harness. You got nervous could... on a damn bridge. Yeah, but I'm trapped. Trapped in a trapped in a in a steel cage. Where I can't get out. You're of. gonna crawl up a hundred and twenty. Oh, foot they got safety net. Or a hundred and twenty story. Net. They don't have no safety net. They click themselves well, on I mean, a cage. You got, yeah, you got those carabiners. Yeah. People do it all the time. Seems, oh, seems pretty shit. safe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No. I'm light. I'm not. I'm not gonna fall out of that thing. I'll tell you what I'll do. What? I'll give you a thousand dollars and you climb climb the radio tower by my house. It's can I have a, it's, all the safety carabiners? Oh, you bet you can. I'll get them for you because it's only. I haven't it's had any only, formal training. It's though. only forty stories I high. I haven't had any formal training. You know, you, what do you need? You just climb up and click click. I down. need formal training. You're not going to do it anyways. Those people, you can't just tell me that they just let those people go. Well, no, they, they have probably, formal training. You wouldn't do it anyways. Uh, if I had the training, I would do it. You I'd wouldn't go four it. stories up a ladder. Be the easiest thousand dollars I've ever made. My dad was a retired fireman, and one of the last mm-hmm. things they had to do is they had to climb up a, I think it was, six story ladder, just a freestanding ladder with a rope on each end. They had to climb up and crawl up over the top and go down their side. Yeah. Ain't no way in hell I'm doing that shit. There's nothing that makes you more nervous than being on a ladder. Hmm. Hots. Well, just the ladder in general. I could stand on a roof. That wouldn't make me nervous. But no. going up the ladder is the no, part. That's, that's the sketchy part. I'm, I'm with you. We went to Vegas to the Stratosphere one time. We, me and Michelle used to go up there and eat dinner sometimes. Okay. And one time we went to the top where the boys went with us. And we went to the, they've got that roller coaster and shit. Mm-hmm. I got that freaking elevator. My fat ass was sucking in concrete because I wasn't getting off that wall. Yeah. There's no way. Oh, you want to go look over the side? Hell no. It is weird when you get up high and all of a sudden you just feel like you could jump over the side. Yeah, you don't want that? to, but you just feel like you might. Yeah. What is that nervous. about? I don't know. Because I have that too. Like you look over and you're like, what if I just jumped? Yeah, no, that's it's a... Like I'm, I'm not suicidal. No. Why am I thinking about jumping? You'd and then you're a, internally fighting yourself. Like, come on, let's. that's a bad thought. Yeah. Let's back this up a little bit. Yes, that's I get a that normal, too. That's a very normal thing too. Right. What, if I just jump? Yeah, I think that's very normal with people. You ever notice in Vegas there's not a balcony? Yeah. You ever notice there's not a balcony in it's Vegas? It's just a lot of fucking people lose a lot of money. <laughs> That's why they do that. Yeah. yeah. Different thing. Heights, jumping off, all we, kind of runs together. We used to, back in the day, he used to stay at the the, the Bass Pro Shops in Embassy Suites. And our buddy of mine, they, they built that hotel. We stayed there all the time. And we went to Mexico when you and me and Michelle, the boys were little. 
and we left that night mm-hmm. and we used to stay on the top floor which i think is the 13th floor they had a big suite they'd always put us in and the, there was there's four suites on each corner right. and they're real nice and while we were gone i was reading the paper and uh the heir to stroh's beer decided to climb out of it with some sheets tied together and slipped and fell and killed himself it's just you know right right life. after we left i mean it had to happen within 30 minutes after we left the left the place but I thought, God Almighty, there's just that same shit. That damn height scared the shit out of me. Yeah. I've never understood the Embassy Suites concept either. Those big open atriums. Oh yeah, in the middle. Yeah, oh. the, you know, you stand there and you look over them. It's like, shit. maybe it's to keep you in line. You're so nervous oh. you can't mess up the hotel. Mm, there's a lot. There's been a lot of incidents where people have fallen off. I'd be more nervous about things. People being drunk and dropping stuff up from up high on somebody in the lobby. I went to a New Year's Eve party at one one time, so it'd been in the early 90s mm-hmm. and that was quite the issue they had that day people throwing furniture out of the rooms and shit or throwing sofas over and shit it was a mess and they're lucky nobody got killed and it was the one, it was only one that was probably four stories high but they trashed that whole place with shit i wonder if their uh insurance adjuster is giving them a hard time <laughs> I, don't want, I, don't, I don't even want to talk about that <laughs> that's a more pain in the ass he's i'm telling you what you try to do things right and they and, and it's just crucify you on stuff yeah so, oh, it's been just terrible. I don't want to talk about it because I'm afraid they'll listen. Bring me over again. <laughs> it's not an injustice, it's an inspector. I got you. No, it's a bad deal. All right, let's get into 50 Ducks. Absolutely. I don't know much about 50 Ducks, so you're going to tell us all about it. Right. So I'm going to tell you what I think I know about. Give it to me. I think it is a program designed to study ducks mm-hmm. and the migrations. And that's all I got. So you fill me in after that. So it's. With geo trackers and everything, like right. we're gonna have yes. like real time data, right? Right. So, kind of. There, there, there's a tremendous number of researchers across North America who are doing the, these telemetry studies. Most of it's state DNRs, and most of it's done through graduate students, academic institutions. There's a wealth of this data out there. I mean, millions of dollars is being spent on these trackers. Um, Fifty Ducks does do some tagging of its own. But we are using this data, which is really used uh, by the scientific community, uh, bag limits, movement ecology, all sorts of stuff like that. We're taking a different spin on it, and we're trying to use it as an educational tool to get kids more into waterfowl. There are a lot of kids who will never experience duck blind, but you can bring, our little quote is, the sky to the screen, right? Mm -hmm. And you can show kids in a school, this is what waterfowl migration is all about. You can also do it with with adults. Um, th- there's a ton of knowledge out there that's just not getting to the right people. There are millions of people in North America, in the U.S. in particular, who, who do not know we have a wetlands problem. Um, they don't know that they should care about it. And so 50 Ducks is coming at it from that angle, an educational angle. Um, so we're giving our, we have a, a website, 50ducks.com. Uh, it's an interactive live stream. Uh, currently, we have 500 birds on there, over 3 million GPS data points um, from historically tagged ducks. Uh, over the course of the next year, we're going to ban about 50 or 100 that will be on a, air quote, live stream with mm-hmm. some you know stuff so you can't find that duck and kill it, of course. Um, so you can follow the, the migration live. So we give it away to kids, uh, anybody in an academic institution, and then we sell memberships to your birdwatching waterfowl community, and we use that to fund uh, future studies. So I'm at the website right now. So like how, how many ducks... You said how many ducks are there banded, what'd you say, um, that have these telemetry units that we can look at? Well, on the website right now, there are yeah. 500 of them uh, on there that are historically tagged. Uh, we're really ro- th- we just got this whole thing rolling pretty recently. This fall is when we'll have our you know, launch, per se, uh, and we'll have a bunch of tags uh, on living ducks. So this, this is fall. brand new. This like, is... This is- the, we're, we're not even to the launch period yet. Well, we're, there's a launch now. There's plenty. I mean, like I said, there's two, three million data points on the website right now from historically tagged ducks. Mm-hmm. Uh, the website's pretty fun already. Um, the, the live stream will come this fall, though. So what what prompted all this? Like, what was going on to where you were like, hey, let's let's make this more enjoyable for kids? Yeah, well, it, you know, I worked in corporate America. Uh, me and my dad uh, were big hunters. Uh, we go to Venice, Louisiana every year, and uh, we had a guide. One year, wasn't the best guide, uh, ran us up on a mud flat, and so we were stuck there all day. And we were sitting there. <laughs> we were there once. <laughs> Been there. <laughs> so so we were sitting there uh, just looking up at the sky, and, and we've gone every year f- for a while. I've got some family in Louisiana, so it's an easy trip. Um, and and some, year the duck, some years the ducks are there, and some years they're not. And so we ask questions that everybody in the world asks, which is, why is that? Where are the ducks? Where are the ducks right now? Um, 
so, so me and my dad, you know, had all day just to sit there and talk about it. And then coincidentally, I read an article uh, about a researcher at, uh, in, in Louisiana, Paul Link, who was doing a bunch of telem- telemetry work on birds in Louisiana. Uh, went down a rabbit hole, started calling a few of these researchers, uh, learned all about this, you know, it's a small, big world, this community. And uh, all these guys are banning these birds for scientific reasons, right? And uh, they have all this data and they're doing so much good work with it. I, I want to really emphasize that. But it's not making its way to you and me, uh, what this data is. Um, it, it's going into uh, P- PhD, the- uh, you know, dissertations, master's theses, and it's going, you know, all the way up to, you know, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, right? But this data can be repurposed and can be used to be really cool and interactive for your everyday duck hunter, your bird watcher, right. uh, your wildlife enthusiast. And so I figured if I was interested in it, and, and they wouldn't share the data with me, I knew there would be other people that would be too. And so that started a, you know, a two-year journey trying to figure out how to get this data, uh, how to ban these birds. Um, and it's been a, a full-time job for me for about the last year. Where, uh, so you're putting a geo tracker on or you're letting someone else put a geo tracker on? A little of both. Not us. 50 Ducks is not, we do not have a license to do this. Uh, our big thing is we help with funding. The, these projects are incredibly expensive. Um, and, and a lot of the money that goes to this is through grant funding. Every, uh, and I've traveled the world meeting with these people. We went to the International Bird Observatory Conference down in Veracruz, Mexico, met with a bunch of people banding, you know, birds of prey, ducks, all sorts of stuff down there uh, from all over the world. Funding is the issue for all of these people. And there are some of these labs you hear about that are super well funded, right? And, and they get tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to do these projects. But there are a bunch of these researchers that just can't get the money to do it. And so that's where we come in. We'll help fund it for you. We'll share, share the data and we'll use the website as a way to drive uh, revenue to help, you know, expand on these programs. How are y'all getting y'all's funding from private sources? Or are y'all doing it's, grants? It's, it's self-funded. It's me. Just you. Whoa. It's me. Yeah. So you're just writing a check out of your own account. Yeah. It's uh that's the scary part of the whole thing <laughs> that, uh, that we hope works with it. Yeah. So this is a business. This is a business. Absolutely. Okay. I, and, and yeah, absolutely. Don't get that, you know, in, incorrect. It, it's meant to do good, but it's also meant to be a business. So you're going to make money is what you're trying to do with doing a good thing. Yes. I got no problem with that absolutely. at all, but that's what, so we're, we're, we're not talking to someone from the U S fish and wildlife service. that's getting a $10 million grant or no. check. You're talking you're, to somebody that, that put their house up as collateral and got a huge loan to start this. And so you're, you're selling people to come to your website and join it. Yes, sir. And when they join your website, they pay how much per month? Right now, in the pre-launch, it's five ninety nine a month or fifty nine for the year. Once we get it launched this fall, price is going up, so you better get it quick. <laughs> Sign so, up now. So we're talking about one hundred dollars a year when it goes up. Yeah, is that pretty close? Give or take, a little more, but just about fourteen ninety nine a month. One hundred eighty bucks a month. Hundred, yeah, fourteen ninety nine a month. Well, so that's, fifteen bucks a month. I mean, one hundred eighty dollars a year. I'm sorry. Yeah, year long discount, uh, one hundred twenty bucks a year. Okay, yeah. so so ten bucks a month, bucks you can month. keep up with your ducks. Absolutely. For your internet scouters, it's the best thing going for you. Uh, absolutely, and, and it's a different. I mean, the mapping world is taking off now. I mean, you got Spartan Forge, you got Hunt Stand, you got Onyx, you got all these guys who are doing, you know, all all of this satellite. I mean, I don't know if you've ever used any of that stuff. Uh, it's mostly for big game. Hadn't made its way to the. Oh no, well, Onyx is a waterfowl. Well, yeah, tool. we've used a little bit. Yeah, I mean they, I guess. Uh, you know, I've talked to Spartan Forge a little more. But anyway, they're starting to get more into it. This is not that at all, right? Um, we're not doing the land data. Ours is 100% movement of waterfowl. No, but what I'm saying is Joe Schmo, that's an internet scouter anyways, uh-huh. for $10 a month, mm-hmm. you can keep up where the ducks are at. If you want to chase them mallards, if there's a couple of mallards that got telemetry on them, uh-huh. You can find out where they're at. I'm not talking about right to Granny's Pond, but you can get an idea where the duck migration is at all times. Right, right. And that's a that's a thing you got to be really specific with. Um, it, you cannot find my ducks. You can't. We, we, we randomize the data. We have limited zoom. What you see is kind of where the duck is. Like you can see the duck is in, in Macon, right? It's mm-hmm. in Macon, Georgia. And that's the level you can see on a live stream. Once the duck moves, I give you all sorts of data. But you're right. It, it, it lets you know generally... The ducks are moving. Uh, we have, you know, overlays with weather, all sorts of fun stuff like that. So it, it, it's a knowledge tool to your internet, you know, scatter the, what you're it, talking about. It's kind of like the, it's it's a lot better version of the bird migration deal. That's the app you can get. We're just, 
a yeah. million and a half birds. Come. I got it one time just to notice the birds that come through the town. Right. And you'd be surprised. And it could be sparrows and whatever it is. That's the Audubon. That's yeah, the, the Audubon. Born, one Cornell Lab of Ornithology and the Audubon Society. Yeah. Yeah. Like Super three, cool. Super three cool. and a half million birds came through Knox County last night. I'm like, son of a bitch. You know, they might be doves, blackbirds, whatever it is. Right. And it'll show kind of this is a species. Well, this here, you can track just ducks. Right, individual ducks. And, and, that, and that's the that's the, that's the the fun part of it. I mean, you know, for the birds that we have banded, it, it truly is the first thing I do in the morning. I log on uh, and I look at it. And we had a duck come through here uh, just east of Lubbock, came pretty near you guys. Uh, we named him Fat Daddy. I got a group of kids, extra special kids in Atlanta, um, who, who named the ducks. So there's some funny names. <laughs> that you, you, you get a green bean and a Fat Daddy and MJ, all sorts of fun names like that. Miss Quack Quack. So, yeah. so Fat Daddy was a blue wing teal, blue wing teal, and and I learned something today that something I pretty pretty had a pretty good idea about was the blue Fat Daddy was the blue wing teal. Yep, got banded in Mexico. Yep, we're at Mexico, Jabe. Uh, it's Toluca, Mexico. It's just west of Mexico City. If in the you, mountains. If you scroll down on that homepage, yeah, we got a, a a free map on the homepage. Fat Daddy's one of the five you can see on it right there. Blue wing teal. Up more. Right, no, that's it right there. See the this? map. Scroll down a little bit. See the blue wing teal. Uh, so there's yeah. the map. That's what it looks like in a limit capacity. This with with five ducks. So if you go to YouTube, you can see this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's on YouTube right now. Right there, east of uh, in Texas, blue dot, east of Texas. The, this one? No, nope. nope, to the left. To the left. Oh, right there. Oh, okay, okay, click on okay. It. I see what you mean now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You click so on you that. Click duck. on that duck. Fat, no. There's Fat Daddy. So you can you can hold your cursor over and it'll show you what the ducks are, right? And then if you double click on it, so go down to Fat Daddy and double click on him. Oop, it's zooming me out. Let's. See. Fat Daddy, we got a loading screen now. We're going to blame it on the Wi-Fi. This we is are going to blame it on... The there we go. All right, so there you can see. If you zoom in, each of those dots represents a one-hour increment. So our GPS trackers give you uh, a data point every hour, right? And So he's about to... That's the place in Mexico where they got all the fucking weird uh, rivers with the dolls in it and shit, I think. Well, that's where he started. That's where he started, yeah. Okay, that's where he was banded at. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming he was banded in January, February, or March, maybe? He was banded April 5th of uh, 2023. Okay, and then he drove, came up, and he made it to Madam... That's not Madam Morse. Monterey. Down to Monterey, Nueva Laredo, mm -hmm. Ciudad Acuna. Oh, hell. I'm having hell here. Took a stop at... There Boy you go. Click the uh, two arrows going different ways. Take you to full screen. Over there on the right-hand side. Right hand side. Up, up a little bit. Oh, up. this one? Yep, click that. It'll give you full screen. There, there we go. go. Over now on the right hand side, we got his profile too. We try and make it fun for kids, all the some fun facts, weather. Uh, so, what is this right here that's on the right side? Is that what he's experiencing yep. right now? How so much he weighs? 413 grams. No, oh, the wind direction, wind speed, all that. Yeah, that's from his last GPS data point. Um, Fat Daddy, you can see his last data point over there, Fort Stockton, Texas. Um, uh, Fat Daddy is, is, is no longer with us, but he. Uh, he got killed? He, he just, yeah, he died. On his own or get shot? He didn't get shot. So the GPS units, you can see them here. They've got laser etched on the side. It's got our phone number on them. So the hunter mortality is, is, of course, a thing with a lot of these researchers, and they laser etch their name on the side. So if you kill one of our ducks, great. Congratulations. The hope is you'll call us. We'll mail you a, a replica, and you can mail us that one back because those things are those things are expensive. You want to get them back. How so, much are those? $1,200 a piece. Ooh. So did Fat Daddy, uh, did someone find him? <clears throat> nope. So Fat Daddy's just... That day he's gone. And there's no, did you try to go to where the last, uh, but, and the reason I'm asking you this is they banned some speckle bellies out here and they right. put trackers on them. Yep. And one time a tracker, one got killed and a buddy of mine went and got the tracker for him in a field. They could right. go to, so do you know exactly where he's at? We, we so the limitation with these is they use the cell service. They, mm -hmm. they transmit through cell service. So is it, if a duck is where there is no cell service. So let me back it up. The trackers give you one, you can set them to however you want them. Ours are set where you get one data point an hour right it logs into the tracker and it stores it inside of it mm -hmm. they try and transmit through the cellular network twice a day if they can't connect to the cell network it tries again at the next interval so it'll backlog like when these ducks are in the heart of mexico or you know prairie canada they could go weeks or months without sending you data and then as soon as they get to cell service when they're in the window you get three months backlog data so let me ask you this. Here's my dumb question. Each point, so you got San Angelo and then almost Sweetwater. Yep. That was one hour? Go so down that's a movement point. Yep. You can zoom You can zoom all the way in on that thing, and you can get to within three feet of where that go, was. Go, that go to the north one, north of Sweetwater, the closest one to us right there. He was in Rotan. I already, oh, wrong way. Okay, and you can click on it. Yeah, so he was in between uh, Rotan and He was between Hamlin, Hamlin and Rotan. Yeah, 3.55 in the morning. Huh. 
So he flew all night. And you can zoom in all the way until you are literally on top of it. Now, oh yeah, he was just on some little bitty pond right but, there. But, so you can real data time your ducks and track them during the day data. Because the reason I'm asking, that internet scouting guy's like, oh shit, no. right now. When does it, when no, does no, it no. come on this? No, no, no. This, so this is after these ducks disappeared. You get this level of zoom in during the live stream. It, it's it's restricted and it's a very general data point for a living duck. Otherwise, your Joe Smo would kill a duck. So basically, what you're saying is you're just going to know they're in an area within 30 miles of somewhere. Within uh, the data is randomized, so it's an inexact location, and then we put it in a 10 square mile box. Okay, there, and let me tell you, internet scatters out front. I know about our birds that they've bound, they've banded here with the trackers and stuff. Right. They can track it to the same field, and you still. Oh yeah, <laughs> I mean it's such it's, a crapshoot. It's crapshoot of you seeing that bird. I've seen some of the speckle bellies with the net collars here. Right. But not because I knew that they were going to be in a certain field because I don't have that kind of data ever. You may, you may. I just kill, know they're in our area. Yeah, and you may kill one of these birds, but you will not kill this bird because it is on my map. Right. They'll right. just. But you, after it's, it's over, chance. you can see where it's at. Oh, of course. That is some yeah. farmers hunt and feel that's that's a that's a really cool that's a really cool deal follow him up i want to see where so this is what i found really interesting about this blue wing teal so fat daddy never ever ever made it to oklahoma i mean kansas nope. he stayed in oklahoma is yep. where he wintered or summered yep had babies nested whatever a, yep drake blue wing teal. a drake well but he was with a yep yep of course but that was his that's his winter or summer grounds his nesting grounds so oklahoma and it was in where at Hooker Oklahoma. Hooker, Oklahoma was his nesting grounds. And then he f would fly. He'd go from Hooker to Clayton, New Mexico, stay around Hereford. I'm assuming at a feedlot up there. There's a, something around Hereford he stayed a bunch in. Mm -hmm. When was he in Hereford, Andy? Look at that. I'm curious about the dates on that. It's in June, I'm pretty sure. June? Yeah. God dang. When did he go? So when did he go to Hooker in Oklahoma? Uh, that was June, in July. Yeah. No, June too. No. Oh, so he went there. So he went this way. He went. Yeah, west, he came up there, took a left, crossed over, and went north. Up to Dalhart and then over. And then took a right and came south. How long did he stay? How long when was he in Perryton? What was the date on it? I'm wondering when he made his trek back down south. June sixteenth. No, that's going up still. Where's Perry? Where's to Perryton? the right. North of Borger, straight up. Right no. down the border. No, that was his down. Yeah, that's coming back that's down. Coming so back that's coming back down. That was September fifth. Yep. So, so he stayed here basically all summer. Yep. Yep. Erotic. And then September 5th, he started making his trek back south. Yep. You got another duck we can look at? That's interesting. That's yeah, a we, fucking cool. How old was Fat Daddy? Do we know? Uh, he was a, he was an adult bird when he was banded. What's a blue wing teal? They, they live four or five years? Just depends. Yeah. It's like, like a, anything. Like a mallard is going to hit 10 years if they don't. I mean, they got... Some Maybe them, it just it, right. it it entirely depends, and we're gonna we're gonna preface everything with this. I'm not a wildlife biologist, so let's not get real <laughs> technical about anything duck related. That's okay. Most of them I dealt with here a whole lot smarter than anyways. <laughs> if you hit the uh, house button, top left hand corner, right by the fifty ducks tracking signal, right there, you hit that house button, it'll take you back to the screen. All right, so these are your five uh, free ducks that are on the home screen of our uh, of North our Dakota, North Dakota spoonbill, yeah. I think. Yep, that is a northern shoveler uh, scoop. He he lived. Uh, he was tracked for eighteen months. He went north, south, and back north again. Is he uh, dead too. Yep. God, I'm mad. We got some bad stats here on these birds. <laughs> well, these are banded Holy from a while ago. Shit. This one was banded back in 2018. So he also got banded in Mexico at the same spot. Yeah, this is with uh, my partner Manuel uh, Grosolet, uh from Tierra Davis. Runs a nonprofit down there. He's a licensed bird bander in. Mexico, the United States, and Canada. Uh, he is the man when it comes to uh, bird banding. He's banded everything from hummingbirds uh, to black hawk eagles, ducks, everything in between. What's well, hummingbirds going to be something else? So it looks like, let's go to the top. Is that Quill Lake area? Or is that going to be further west? I think that's further west. Let's give a little click. Maybe have to zoom in. Yeah, zoom in on it. Okay. Let's see. Oop, wrong way. I'll figure it out here in a minute. Ooh, we're going way the wrong way. It's that flat earth, Andy. You all about that. See there? That's how the map is. Now I got to go up. I'm figuring it out on the fly. It takes, it takes a little getting used well, to. Well, and it's just I got this cursor thing. It'd be a lot easier if I was on my phone. Because I don't know. I keep going the wrong way to zoom in. I zoom out. This is like... Uh, we had we had an episode with Charles Beatty where I was trying to work the map and <clears throat> where the old we used to do it in the dining hall and there was a 
there was a big light and I could hardly ever see the screen. And like, he's trying to tell me where to fucking go. And I couldn't hardly see the screen. Even this one's kind of hard to. It's June. Rose and to, town. And to clarify on this project, we do, we do some banding with our, our partners. Our, our big thing is helping fundraise for, you know, scientists, academics who are already doing these projects. That's where we really come in uh, to play. So there's June 9th. Yeah. 2018. And a lot of these birds, I mean, we got over, 500 birds. We'll have about 1,200 on the map come September from these historical data points, and they rain. They go all the way back to 2003 uh, up until you know last year. So there's birds from here, there, and everywhere. So how long did uh, Scoop here? He was transmitting for 18 months. For 18 months, he transmitted. He went from the middle of the Canadian prairies all the way to the lower part of Mexico. Well, we started Mexico, went all the way up uh, around Saskatoon, came back south. Uh, his second. Time. He stopped in Texas, went back north, uh, stopped transmitting around Devil's Lake, So, if I remember correctly. Somebody shoot him, or if he did, you don't know it? Uh, if, if they did, we don't know it. And they didn't call in the band either, right? No, so pretty sure that one just died. Is that where, that, that's where it that's ended the last right there? Location. Yep. Poor Scoop. At 6 o'clock in the morning. On July, in July, mm. so. Got Might have just died something. from old age. You know. Could have just died from old age, you know. See where he died at the Holy Rosary Cemetery. He knew well, where he was going. You know, he knew where he he knew where he needed to end up. <laughs> Has anybody ever went and tried to go to that location to see if you could find a band at all? So or the duck. We we've we've done it before, and and it's just a matter of if it makes you know financial sense to try and find it in a lot of the cases. And two, if they die in a wetlands area, I mean, yeah. you're not gonna find it. No, no, that's exactly right. You're not gonna find it. Um, but if they die in a you know a freshly mowed field you can of course find them so for ten dollars a month how many ducks are we going to get to watch and look at on the live stream mm -hmm. uh between around 50 at all times is our goal that's awesome geese are just all ducks geese too that that's where our friends uh gotta mention jack minor our friends up at jack minor they're in the permitting process uh with the, the canadian government so just you know whenever they can you just don't know how long that's going to take permitting but uh they, they're trying to do a light pollution study uh, with mallards and with Canada geese. So once they get that done, we'll have some uh, Ontario geese banded as well up there. The elephant in the room nobody's talking about in the waterfowl world, really, and it's just now, is the, the mallards are in trouble right now. Mm -hmm. They've, they're have they crashing. Their numbers are. I think they're long-term. Someone in the know, and I'm not going to mention his name. I don't want to do that to him, but we were talking about this the other day, and he told me like the mallard numbers are like a third of what they were 10 years ago. Yeah, and and I can't speak to I, I don't want to you know get out above my skis here. I'm not a wildlife uh, waterfowl biologist. Uh, you know I know what you guys know about that, and uh, you, you know, but they're you know it's cyclical, and duck numbers are down right now, and and a big part is, is habitat, and and that's a big part of what we're trying to do with fifty ducks. Is there are a lot of people who don't know that habitat's a problem that would care if they were introduced to it? So. Yeah. Well, I was talking to um, <clears throat> to our friend that set this all up, and he said, um, so he lived in San Francisco for a while, mm -hmm. and I guess there was a whale back in the 90s that got caught in a ship channel, and they gave it like a fun name, yeah. and like everybody was, it was like Willie the, the Humpback or something, right. Herb, Herbert the Humpback or something like that. Yeah. Is that kind of where some of this came from? Like, give them a fun name and like yeah, make it and, family friendly. And that that that's for the kids. And we let the kids name the ducks. Uh, my fiance is a, a, a special ed teacher in, in Atlanta, and uh, I let her class name. Oh, really? A lot of these ducks, and that's why you know you get some really fun names with it. Uh, yeah. I got a couple schools now um, that are naming ducks for us. Uh, Miss Quack Quack uh, came from a friend of mine, uh, Maggie Sowell, uh, teaches in Cashers, North Carolina. Uh, that's her first grade class. They named that duck. So I think that's awesome. Yeah, and it, and, and 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 it becomes super personal because mm -hmm. it's your duck, right? Yeah. You can log on. You know, teachers get a free subscription. So all you gotta do is email me. If you're a teacher, you want to use it in the classroom, you shoot me an email. I'll get you on that oh, day. That, that's awesome, yeah. right there. I so, think that's a great deal. I've got a. I'm doing a. Um, I don't even know what you'd call it. A presentation mm -hmm. with our 4H on next week yeah. here at the lodge. And I'm going to talk about this. Talk about it. Because I think this is a really cool deal to get kids interested in something besides playing a damn video game. 100%. Well, and it kind of tra it kind of it crosses over a little bit. Yeah, it does. And it's and it's and this is just the beginning. I mean, we got some some really smart guys, you know, helping us with this map and, and doing a bunch of other stuff that you get with this data. I mean, I have millions of pages of Excel spreadsheets, and we run it through, you know, R and, and all those programming languages to, to kind of get into it. And we're not a tenth as good at it as uh, – uh, these academic institutions and and you just need somebody who takes what they're doing um and makes it for the common man and for the kid because if you read some of the abstracts on you know 
Mallard ecology, like you're lost in three sentences. Yep. And if we're lost in three sentences, the kid's lost on the second word. And so if you have Miss Quack Quack and all you need to know about that duck is yesterday it was in Stuttgart and today it's in it's in the Gulf of Mexico, like anyone can understand that that's cool, right? And so that's just where you start is you have to build a base of knowledge from somewhere. You can teach kids so much. You can, First of all, you can make it fun. Like, hey, let's check and see where Mr. Quack Quack is today. Right. And our class is sponsoring this duck. Right. Maybe the other class sponsors one and they'll have a race to see who gets to their uh, – the Hunter. further south they're going to be, or who stops in uh, Mississippi first, if huh. you take it, you know, and make yeah. a game out of it. 100%. And you can teach some kids about geography because I, there's so many adults, my wife is one included, that don't know the difference between Iowa and Nevada on the map. And it wears me out sometimes. People need to know geography. What a good way to teach kids something. Well, I'll tell you, uh, speaking of learning geography, I've learned a tremendous amount of geography in the last two years. <laughs> I mean, I was looking at, you know, as Fat Daddy was tagged, we were following him live. That was when we were, you know, using, trying to learn about all this technology, uh, you know, last year when we were really getting this thing, the back end built for it. Um, you know, I was shocked that he stopped. I was thinking, Hooker, Oklahoma's you know, not very far north. And then I started running the numbers, and Hooker, Oklahoma is as far from Mexico City as it is from Saskatoon. So oh. it, it's he went a really long way, and and I haven't. I'm pretty sure that Fat Daddy traveled uh, about five thousand miles over the course of nine months. So. It's also high elevation there. It is. It's like four thousand feet mm-hmm. elevation. Yep. So it's not like I mean it's arid Oklahoma, right? But it's got a lot of elevation to it. Yeah. It is too because someone we were just talking the other day, Canadian Texas from Canadian Texas to South Padre Island is one mile further or one mile less than it is if you go from Canadian Texas to the Canadian border. Right. It's only one mile difference. And that's what you're talking about, about learning geography. Yes. And you're not even, you don't, you're not being preached to. You, right. you don't, you don't think you're, you're learning. And what you are learning is really cool. And our Instagram, um, we try and write those posts a little different than your typical Instagram post. Uh, and, and we make them pretty informative. And so they're really long, uh, but it's gotten a really good response. And, uh, you know, we do a bird of the day. Uh, where we highlight one of the birds from our map and we give you a really in-depth view of it. You know, the altitude, th- these trackers are incredible and the, and the data these scientists are getting are unbelievable. I mean, they've got, you got the speed, the altitude, you know, the heading, temperature, all sorts of stuff that comes on it. Andy, um, go back and check that uh, the goose up by Rochester, was, New York. I was going to see if Instagram was in a better mood. Oh, go to the one on the right. Over here? Oh, yeah. by Rochester? Yeah. That's, so, a, that's a long-tailed duck. Oh, cool. Holy hell. He State. chilled in the Hudson for a long time. Mm-hmm. And then went right down to where we were at. And we got a bunch of uh, a bunch of eiders and king eiders uh, from uh, up there around Greenland. Uh, those are really fun. I really like looking at those tracks, too. I mean, the whole thing is uh, we got 15 different species on the map right now. There's something for everybody, um, even at this point. I want I was going to burn some miles and go to Greenland or Iceland, uh-huh. air my airline miles. And I thought, I'm going to go to Reykjavik. I thought it would be a really cool place to go. And then yeah. I got all the damn volcanoes going now right so hey, it's not a good idea but i would love greenland there ain't much there, there's not much tourism in greenland it's not green no <laughs> no have you been there i never have i would like to go though yeah i like going to different places one of the uh one of the guys that um that works w- uh, with jack minor uh oliver love from the university of windsor um he he has done a lot of banding up in greenland i, I think he's about to go spend uh, a couple months up there right now and do some more research but uh talking to those guys that live in places like that, in a camp for a while, you got to really love it to do that. And mm-hmm. eat a lot of brant goose. So that's basically that little place right there. He's staying along that river in that in that bay of the Hudson Bay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and there's some as the these telemetry units come a long way every year. And yeah. some of these from the older projects, like you get the data, it, it's gotten a lot better even over the last five years as opposed to some of these birds. Like that bird's from pretty sure it's from 2012. So they continue to get better, and uh, the frequency of transmissions, the, the the battery life, all that stuff continues to get better and better. So if we if we bought into it right now, I, I'm going to buy them when I get to the house anyways or to my office. I'll get you a free subscription. Well, I, I'm not trying to I'll dem- tell you that I'm on air. I'm going to charge you. Okay. No, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'm not trying to Democrat nothing out of you. But if someone goes in and buys it, they're going to see more than these five ducks. 500. Five, see right there at the bottom, you see the species across the bottom? Mm-hmm. Right here. That tells you how many of each one we got. Like uh, one to your right is tundra swan. We Ooh. have 50 tundra swans on there. Eurasian teal? Eurasian teal. I don't Banded know. in Italy. So this is, we got some birds, not we did not ban them. This is repurposed data. Some of these birds were banded. We got a Japanese pintail that were banded to see how they interacted with your West Coast pintail. Uh, you got Eurasian teal banned in Italy that made their way into Siberia. 
Uh, cinnamon t- teal were banded by our friends at Tierra Davis in uh, La Paz, Mexico, which is uh, Baja, California. Um, blue wing teal, uh, a bunch of those were banned in Louisiana. Um, so there's 500 active. Not at the, these are historical. How ducks. many active ducks we got right we're, now? We're launching it in the fall, so we're waiting. We're going to roll it out in the fall. We don't have it. We're not. Do you have any idea that you could tell people a ballpark over 20 ducks, 100 ducks? Come this fall, it'll be it'll be 50. There'll be 50 ducks. That's 50 ducks. Makes sense. Yep. So there'll be 50 ducks I'll that you'll be able to follow to the this fall. Start. Yep. How many of the 50 ducks that you're going to have the transmitters? How many do you think? You're going to get back. Of the transmitters, the, uh, you know, we built in the model. We weren't going to get any back, so everyone's a, everyone's a win. <laughs> yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's I, I couldn't begin. I mean, and with 50, your sample size isn't huge, right? So it's it would be tough to gauge it based on what your, you know, your hunter, uh, you know, your duck mortality rate due to hunting is uh, versus predation. So it would be tough to guess. If we got 10 back, I would, I would call that a home run, um, you know. I saw where they uh, was it. Is it Birdologist, the California guy? <clears throat> yeah. Is his or somebody's Instagram there day they banded some uh, Eurasian widgeons. Really? They they caught them in some trap. I thought those were pretty cool. That's with uh, California waterfowl, right? Yes. Brian uh, Huber. Huber. Yeah, Brian. He's been on the podcast. For sure. He's a sharp guy. He's, he's a one super of them. Sharp guy. He's one of them biologist guys. That's sharp. I've talked to him uh, before. He's he's a super with it guy. Uh, super nice guy. I never met him. Don't know him personally, but uh, from what I've heard, he's a He's a stand-up guy. He's a hunter and an out- a scientist. Which is important, too. Yes, uh, very important. Which is very important. You don't need a pencil pusher doing some of the things that we do, mm-hmm. but you do have need. You have needs for a pencil pusher. For sure. But I want the guy to run the Department of the Interior to be a hunter. They just have to have an understanding of where hunters come from uh, in large part. And if you can you can empathize and you can understand that it, it all comes from a— or for most hunters, it comes from a place of conservation and a place of love, um, which is often overlooked by the non-hunting community. Yeah, if it wasn't for hunters, we wouldn't have birds. No well, I, I'm sure y'all have heard about like the big game imports that they're doing in England now. Like that's going to kill trophy hunting in Africa if they continue doing stuff like that. So it's, they're doing like the the UK just passed. Uh, it, the, I, they're in the process of passing a bill that would ban the import of trophy game from Africa into uh, oh, England. If you shoot one, yeah, you in can, Africa, you can't import the mount back. Okay, so Oof. that's I mean that's going to kill big game, and it's only from certain places and certain animals. But it's going to kill big game because that the only reason those animals are not all poached is is because right. they have a value, right? And so they're protected, right? I mean, so. Stuff so like that's once, a bad deal. Once you take the value of an elephant being shot out of the market, yep. they're going to kill every one of them because they're detrimental to their crops. Yeah, or a poacher will kill it and take the ivory, and there's nobody to protect it because there's no value there. That, 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 and you can't expect somebody to do something just, I mean, because it's if it's if everyone's got to make a living. you know. So. Yeah, those elephants are so important to those uh, African communities, yep. and the non-hunter does not understand that. No. If you take the value out of that, those people have nothing else to sell. That's it. That's what they've got. Well, you get into, and I had this, this discussion. We were in uh, La Paz this December um, doing some banding work with uh, Tira Davis, and, and a group of bird watchers came while we were putting on you know, just your metal leg bands, and, and they were talking about it, and one of them was, was super anti-hunting. Like, I just can't understand how anyone would ever be about that. Uh, and, and my comment to her was, well, Let's 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 take a step back and think about it. You know, how much how, how many acres of wetland have, have you managed in your life? How right. many duck bu- you know wood duck boxes have you put up? She said, well, none, but I haven't killed any either, and, and that's not a good enough answer. Like that's you're not helping. You're hurting. You're she hasn't killed. Her answer was she hasn't killed. I any. haven't killed any. Right. How much have you put into preserving though? Right. That's what I'm saying. Yes. It's like she's never put up a wood duck box. She you know isn't she's not in the, the CRP program. She's not buying ammunition that's going right back into funding you know conservation and, and all the other ways that you can be a part of it. She's not educating kids. She's not doing any of that. She's just I'm not killing them. I think hunting's bad and that's the end of the conversation and that's not that's the wrong way to look at it. You don't have to be a hunter. You can be a bird watcher mm-hmm. but there are ways that a bird watcher can help we can all be on the same team with that non-hunters contribute zero most times now right. i'm not talking about someone that writes a check to delta ducks unlimited uh smithsonian whatever the hell it is audubon society right if you do that then you're helping for sure but the guy who goes and gets in his his canoe and is a granola cruncher and just goes up and down the rivers all day he don't buy shit 
Right. Those things are funded by hunters and fishermen. And that's that that's what I'm saying. And those people just do not get that. Those right. birds are there. If it wasn't for Ducks Unlimited, we would not have duck steel. No, and, and that you're a hundred percent right. And, and fifty ducks is coming trying to come at conservation through a, a private sector model and trying to get more people on board with this because there is value to having bird watchers be into ducks too. There's, there's a ton of value to uniting. There are a lot more birders than there are duck hunters, right? But all the money's coming from the hunters. So how do you get alternative funding sources to wetlands conservation? And, and 50 ducks is not the answer, but it can be a part of the solution. Yeah, it, it, it's not just ducks. I mean, you look at uh, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. Mm-hmm. There are elk now. We have, we have a herd of elk here now. Mm-hmm. now. It wasn't because of Rocky Mountain Elk, but we do have elk here. If everybody will leave them alone... Probably in 20 years, there'll probably be an elk season in West Texas. Huh. There's, I think the Davis Mountains now is finally having an elk season. I don't know for sure, but they have huntable numbers down there now. Oklahoma has elk hunting. Nebraska, Kansas. I mean, all through the Midwest now, and elk are plains animals. Right. But they're here because of hunters. Right. And the hunters are the ones that are making it where, where you're seeing them now. Right. And, and it's that way everywhere. I mean, well, even the mountain lions in California are out of control now. Yeah. But, I saw that a mountain lion killed somebody. Yeah. They were shed hunting maybe the other day. It attacked two people, killed one of them, yeah. maybe. Brothers. Or, yeah. Killed a brother and hurt the other one pretty bad. Same the other one. That's what I heard. I didn't see that. I saw that on yeah. Outdoor Life. You get a 150 pound cat. That dog raised 70 pounds. Can you imagine a cat twice that big? I mean, that's scary. Well, think about a think about a wolf that comes in a pack that yeah, weighs that's... 200 pounds. What are you going to do with six of those? Well, shoot them. They had to shoot every one of them. Pray. I still don't understand <laughs> the whole wolf thing. I don't, I don't, the bunny huggers, I don't. It's a tough, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a complex thing, just, and I don't know enough about it, but you're right. You can't just say there should be wolves. Like, that's not. Some things just outlive themselves. We can get rid of mosquitoes. They're, I'm telling you right now, if you come up with a solution to get rid of every mosquito, there'd be a group of people out there bitching and raising hell. They over probably, a damn mosquito. They probably don't live where there are a bunch no. of mosquitoes. <laughs> but a wolf's the same way. I don't know what it does to add nothing. It's just a killer. And it's it's not like it kills just to eat. It kills for fun and sport. Mm-hmm. But I saw, an, I saw in Idaho, there's a sector up there. Before they introduced wolves, had 15,000 elk. Right. And they put in six, elk, six wolves. Now there's 150 wolves there, and there's 1,500 elk. Yeah. Well, something's wrong. Right. You know, yeah. so if you live in Colorado, get rid of them. Have you seen the video where the guy has the mountain lion coming at him? He's like, get back. He's got the pistol. Get yeah. back. And then the, he, he ends up shooting it, doesn't he? Or does he do like a warning shot I've and it seen, turns away? I've seen that video on Instagram, I believe. Um, but I've seen one where it's like, I mean, whew, talk about your heart racing. Be see, glad you had a pistol then. See the grizzly bear the other day coming charging at the guy? No. Shoot, he shot that sucker from here to the wall. With what? A pistol. And I'm telling you right now, he must have shot it right because it sprayed stuff on him after he shot it. You better hit it right with a pistol. Oh, I'd be sh- keep coming. I'd be shooting my. I'd I'd just shit all over myself. There's no way. I'm well, telling you right there. God, I'm mighty. You ever you ever seen the BBC video where that uh, the photographers with the polar bear in the plexiglass case and the bear gets on top of he's he's photographing yes. and yes. he gets on top of it. Yeah. And the bear smells him and comes over there and tries to get in it. That's a funny video. That's an animal that uh, that has no regrets either. Have you, you heard the saying about bears? How you're supposed to handle them, right? If it's black, fight back. If it's brown, <laughs> lie down. If it's white, say goodnight. Yeah. Fuck, you know? I don't know about You're that. You're the bait on a, on a polar bear hunt. And you know, there's more polar bears now than there has been all this climate, this global warming shit. I think there's more polar bears now than there ever has been. Really? I don't I don't think it's something that non, the bunny huggers want to talk about, but I believe the polar bear numbers are higher now than ever. Yeah. There, that, that's, I'm, I would be scared to death of a bear. Mm-hmm. I'm telling you, I can't imagine being in Alaska or Russia or anywhere with a big brown bear. Right. And coming face to face with some grizzly bear. I mean, yep. I just cannot. It's it's tough to know. And me and you agree on a lot of stuff. And the climate change thing, we could probably have a discussion about. But you know, I'm certainly no canoe granola person either. So, and what part on the the climate? I mean, there's 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 something to it. Oh, we're in a warm cycle. I'm not di- I'm not dis- disagreeing on that. Right. I'm just saying there's more polar bears now. Oh yeah, I than can't there speak. was a yeah, hundred years ago. I'm with you. That that's what I'm saying. I'm not saying that there's not it's not warmer because we haven't had much winter. Right. But I think we're in a cycle. I don't think it's a man-made. One one volcano erupted in Iceland, puts out more CO2 gas than all the cars combined in the history of the world. Right. And and, and there's, like I said, I was just making a statement. There might be something there. Can't speak to it too, in too much depth. But I, start- I definitely think that we're warming. I don't think anybody can debate that. No. <clears throat> what you can debate is 
Is why. That's fair. Is why. Yeah. I don't know if it's all man made, is right. what I'm saying. Quit quit clearing all the trees. I'm with you. You know, we're gonna get rid of all the bees and we're really gonna be screwed because we're all gonna starve to death. Right. There is no doubt that man has uh made a bad imprint on a lot of places. Certainly. I met some really nice gentlemen from California this week at Bass Classic. Mm -hmm. Great dudes, great, great, great guys. And they grew up in California. Mm -hmm. And they're getting the hell out of California. Right. Because of how bad it is now. And the guy gave me a number, and, I, and I, I can't remember what it was exactly, but let's say that when he was a kid growing up in 1975, California had a population of 10 million people maybe. Okay. The whole state. Now there's 40 million people live there or something now. Right. Dallas-Fort Worth used to be a million people in the whole Dallas-Fort Worth area. Now there's, was it six now? I think there's six and a half million now, and they expect it to be 40 or 50 million with, by 2040. Uh, Houston, Austin, and San Antonio is all one conglomerate. All used to be spread out. We're overpopulating stuff. For there's, sure. There's no doubt. But the population numbers are going down worldwide. Mm -hmm. But my God, you can't go nowhere. It's terrible. It's like the big areas are just full of people, and the really? small areas like out here where we are, we don't have very many people. Well, if you make your way to Georgia, I mean, Atlanta feels like it goes 40 miles in every direction. Yeah. I mean, truly. How, how old are you? 29. Did you grow up in the Atlanta area? No, I grew up in Macon. Uh, I'm from Macon. I moved to Atlanta for work. I do not claim to be from Atlanta, and I'm getting out of there as soon as I get married. So, But I have lived there for the past five years now. I didn't know anybody why I lived in Atlanta because I ain't never seen nobody at a stoplight. I've been there. It's uh, I'm not going to comment on that. <laughs> well, uh, we had Bryce Elder on, and he pitches for the Braves. And, I mean, what did he said? North north of town is okay? No, yeah, wherever he's at is nice, he said. Cobb but, County. Yeah, but that's where they the, built the Braves Stadium. That's but Cobb you, County. Yeah, but you get the wrong side of town. Yeah. Now, I'm going to I'm gonna backtrack on my comment I made of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. When I went to Atlanta, the couple times I've been to Atlanta, there's not a lot of white people there. Now, it is more professional black people than anybody I've ever been around and place I've been in my life. When you watch a Tyler Perry film. Right. And he goes to an office building, and it's a black doctor and a black, black attorney and this and that. That's because everybody that's black moves there that's a professional. Yeah. It's really that way. Yeah. When I used to watch his shows, I thought, come on now. And it was, but it is that way. Right. But it is, there is more black people in Atlanta than any place I've ever been in my entire life. That's There is a very high African-American population. Yes. And there are a ton of, like, uh, I live pretty close to Morehouse, one of the HBCUs down there. And, I mean, it's just, it just depends where you are in the city. But. I don't want to go to Atlanta at nighttime in some places, but I don't want to go to Memphis and Dallas and Nashville and nowhere else either. Well, that's, Big that's the way I described everywhere. That's the way someone asked me, you know, when I spend a decent amount of time in Mexico uh, with our partners down there, someone asked me if I was you know, scared of being down there. I said, well, you know, I wouldn't go to Bankhead in Atlanta right. at night. I mean, it's the same thing. They're just, you just got to know where you can't go. I'd rather be in small town Mexico than Atlanta any day. Well, and that's what I'm saying, yeah. Yeah, I mean, We're, I don't want to go hang out with the drug cartel, but just right. a small town, village town in Mexico. Well, and that's what I try to explain bother to people, me at too. All. Like, if, I mean, it's like 99% of Mexico is, is beautiful, and the people are great. So, Where do you fly into, Mexico City? It just depends. You have to connect through Mexico City, basically, wherever you go. Um, that's all. That seems like a very interesting town. Mexico you, City? Yeah. I've, never, I've not spent much time there. The airport is just an absolute cluster every yeah. time you go to it but uh i've never spent any time in mexico so. i want to go to the big cathedral there in the big square everybody tells me said no you don't unless you got a bodyguard because <laughs> they but they kidnap a lot of people and stuff but it's just like no different being in freaking manhattan now yeah. i mean it, you can't go to a big city anywhere in the world and feel safe i don't think yeah um maybe some places in europe poland probably warsaw maybe right i don't know but i just i don't I'm, there's not very many big cities I feel comfortable in. I like being in the country in small towns. So and you'll connect into Mexico City, and then you'll go to another another place, or mm -hmm. you... one of the one of the researchers that that we, that we work with is uh, Mike Cruz Wiki. Uh, uh, he runs a banding station out of uh, Nova Plata, which is south of Sonora. And and if you go down there, you can drive, and you cross the border at Tucson, and you can drive down there. It's about an eight hour drive from there. That's the easiest way to get to there. Um, it just depends, though. But to get to most places in Mexico, you have to connect that aren't like the resort towns. Right. You have to connect to Mexico City. And How many different airports do they have in Mexico City? I mean, you got Guadalajara, you got the resort sound towns. You in Mexico City or in Mexico? No, in Mexico. Once you get outside, how many actual places have jet service? Good, good question. But all those, every resort town does. Oh, they, like Veracruz. Definitely. And then you can fly and you can rent a car and then. You're off and away. I'll tell you a really cool town I went to is Guadalajara. Yeah. And it's a very dangerous place to be these days. Yeah. 
You never had any issues, though, in Mexico? No. Uh, I lost the keys to the rental car one time, and that was a pretty big issue, trying to call a uh, tow truck in Spanish. When I don't <laughs> but never never a safety, never been never been nervous. Um, and I've always done it with, with, with locals, too. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't speak, I speak, I speak very little Spanish. Um, Poquito? Yeah, very small. And so, but no, I've never, uh, there are a few things you have to get used to there. Like their police presence is very different. Yes. Um, like they have, they have trucks with a mounted gun mm-hmm. on the back of them, right? And see, so the first time you see that, you're kind of nervous, but then, you know, they're sitting there eating the Snickers at the gas station, just like everybody. I mean, it's just, it's just culturally different, but no, I've never had any fear at all. Have you ever been there. uncomfortable in Mexico? Uh, no, but like he said, like what we recently got back from, uh, Mexico, uh, Islama Harris and once, twice a day, you're sitting at the resort and here comes that truck you're talking about truck with a mounted weapon. And right. you know, you got two or three guys in the back and you're always, it's funny because we were with, uh, Trevor and his wife from Pacific calls. And like when they first pull up, you're like, how's that make you feel? Right. How you feel? You feel secure? Or do you feel a little uneasy? And I always felt uneasy, but right. And, and I'm sure, and I'm sure the people there felt kind of at ease that those people are there. Right. It's it, again, it's just a cultural thing, and it's different. And when once you once you're down there, when we were in La Paz, I was there for. Uh, we were working for ten days, and, and by the end of it, I mean after the first night, like I was wandering from you know the hotel to the gas station at night to go get you know a snack. And you just you know you're wandering around. La Paz is a pretty good town. Me and people there, right? Yeah, it's a it's a it's a resort town. And I say we were there. We were outside of that. We didn't make it into resort town. But yeah, it's a I mean it's a big place. I always feel like anytime you're in a foreign country, people are going to try to take advantage of you if you're stupid. Yeah, it's because you're always in a resort town. Right. But when I've gotten to outside of resort towns and went to small places, never bothered me at all. Well, we were there as a story about being taken advantage of in La Paz. Well, we were there for a long time, and I was with uh, Manuel uh, Tier Davis, president. We were doing some work down there. Oh, we had a couple of local guys from the college helping us out, right? And so we would work, we'd get up in the morning, and then we'd go to lunch, and I would buy everybody lunch every day. Um, and, and we were eating meals for less than $5 a person, and we were eating like kings. Uh, you know, the last day came around, and I said, hey, I want to go see the resorts. Like, you know, I don't know the next time I'm going to be here. I just want to see them, right? And he said, you, you know, we can eat there, but it's going to be expensive. Right. And, and we took three guys, and for a meal that had been costing $10, 12 $15, we went to the resort, and it was a $100 meal and the same food just because it was, you know, within a mile of a resort. Yeah, when I was um, a young man, early, early 20s, we were in Puerto Varda, and me and some buddies rented a Jeep, and we drove up in the mountains to mm-hmm. the little villages. Now, if you look back at Narcos, that was really a stupid thing to do because we were right around where all that shit was going on. Mm-hmm. But, fuck, we'd go into the bar and have a beer and then go to the next town and have another beer and just drove around all over. Right. My biggest fear was running over a dog. Because if you run over a dog, you got to pay for it supposedly. Okay, you know, and and we were in these little towns with no stoplights, no just cobblestones. Right, but had a good time. Had yeah. a had an absolute blast. But I like seeing different things. But I never was uncomfortable no. at all. Never. I was too stupid to be uncomfortable because I was probably in some really bad spots. Yeah, but when you're 21, 22 years old, you're bulletproof anyways. That's you know. But I, I like foreign countries. I think what you're doing is really neat. I think that you can educate so many people with this. Right. And, um, man, the schools, this ought to be something that schools and ags and there's a lot of duck hunting kids. We have a lot of duck hunting kids. And for, I can't believe their parents let them listen to our podcast, but they do uh-huh. a lot of kids that this would really be something for them. It's an educational tool for sure. And that's the main goal here. And, and like I said, fundraising too. like our partners, I mean, these telemetry projects are incredibly expensive at $1,200 a unit. You know, that's not counting time and, and people and field work deploying them, uh, it's it's untenable for a ton of researchers out there. Um, mm-hmm. When we went to the International Bird Observatory Conference, which is a worldwide conference I hold every four years, um, it, it's not mostly for waterfowl, but but I went down there uh, this past year for it, and that was the the like I said earlier, the big thing there was just research funding the hardships, especially in Latin America, Mexico, South America. I mean, it's just if you can't find grant money, you can't do it. Right. So. The uh, the the tracking unit that goes on the back that's twelve hundred bucks. Is there yep. any cost difference in that net collar that you have there? They're about the same. They're about the same. Yeah, they're the the net collars uh, a little less expensive as they get bigger. They become less expensive. Oh really? Because the the expensive part is the hardware that's in it and and making it small, right? Because right. there's a little computer in that thing, and uh, and the battery's expensive too. The solar charging, 
uh, is a big uh, pain point w uh, with the whole thing. So as you get bigger with them, it's counterintuitive. They become a little less expensive. So they'll put that on and they'll put just like your regular leg, leg band on with it, or will it just be that? So they'll put that, they'll put the tracker on its back, right? It sits right on its back. And when we get done, you can look at the Instagram. I got some pictures of it. And I've got plenty of them on my phone I can show you. Uh, you build a harness. You run the harness right here under the wings, pop it on, uh, observe the bird. It takes less than 10 minutes to put one on if you know what you're doing. Really? Mm -hmm. You put the leg band on too. Yeah, in the U.S. and Canada, you cannot band a bird and not put a, uh, a federal leg band on it. A leg band on it. Mm -hmm. But in Mexico, you can get around that? No, we still put a leg band on you it. Tier Davis is a... Uh, Manuel is a, a master bander in Mexico, and he is putting on bands down there. They don't have a federal banding system like we do here, though. Mm -hmm. uh, he self-funds most of the bands he puts on. Um, and, really? And, and he, he's gotten... They don't do it anymore, but he used to get a bunch of his bands from the BBL, the Bird Banding Lab here in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think they do that anymore, but, I mean, he's a man that truly loves it and has been coming out of pocket for, for decades to do this. And that's how it is in a lot of places... Um, you know, that, that don't have, I mean, America's got it figured out with the, with the banding system I mean, they got it figured out uh, and it, it's the model for conservation, um, across the world. And then they, they, they do not have that in Mexico. Um, and, and people down there desperately want it. Some of them do. You know? Well, how do you think America figured it out? Do you think it's just because it, there was enough interest in it that they could generate revenue? To put money into this? I, I think that the, the hunting culture is just so deeply ingrained in so many Americans that it, it. I don't know. It's a big citizen science thing too. Like you, they've done a really good job with with leg bands of making people excited to kill a banded bird and to right. call it in. Right. Um. And, and it's not the same with with like a collared deer. Uh. Somehow, if you 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 kill one of those, you feel like it's not wild. But if you kill, you know, a banded bird, like it's been handled by a human before. You're not the first person to touch that bird. But for some reason, we still feel like it's a trophy, even though it's not. You know, it's been touched by the dumbest human bird in the before. flock. We're proud to shoot, but if we get the banded, you feel like a real ass if you shoot a collared deer, right? You think, man, what kind of person am I to shoot that deer? Right. It's like it's a pet, but we yeah, don't right. feel that way about the birds for some reason, and so yeah, no, it's a trophy, and it always will be. Yeah, hundred percent. And people, it's crazy. We'll have I'll have an old guy every year in here that duck hunts constantly. I'm not talking about a guy never shot a banded bird. I'm talking to a guy seventy years old, been hunting since he's been 15, 14 years old. Been with people that have shot them and never shot a banded bird. Yeah. And then you'll get the guy that's on a corporate hunt that's never hunted before and will shoot a banded bird. You shoot a double band. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You shoot a flock of them. And we can't talk about banding without me mentioning Jack Miner. Uh, I know you guys know their story. Jack Miner himself was the first person in North America to put a band on a duck. Um, he did that in the early 1900s, banded bird up there. Got killed in uh, got killed in South Carolina. First birdie banded. Got killed by a hunter in South Carolina. Uh, he helped he was one of the fathers of the, you know, the North American bird banding treaty. Um, and Jack Miner has been banding birds continuously since I'm pretty sure it's 1908. So over a hundred years. Did he, uh, when did he put Bible scripture on the very first ones? He did. So the very first bird he man mounted, I'm going to tell you, you talking about an expensive trophy. Could you imagine if you had the very the first very band first he one? had, what that would be worth? They've got in, uh, it's in Kingsville, Ontario. It's, uh, you find it in Detroit. It's, a little more than an hour in the car. It's very easy. Uh, they've got the, the the museum up there, and it's cool. And they 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 band a couple thousand birds a year. Um, Joe Vermeulen is as into it a guy. He's their uh, bander. He raised his family in a house on the Jack Miner grounds. I mean, he's as devoted as you can be to it. Uh, Tom is their executive director. Uh, he's he's doing a great job up there. And 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 Jack Miner's got a sweet thing going. I mean, when they're feeding, they got they grow their own. You know, they got a cornfield and they. Put out enough feed where they grow it themselves. Uh, you can see it when they're getting birds up over there, and they're getting tens of thousands of ducks and geese up. I mean, it's it's a how many place. birds they band a year? A couple thousand ducks thousand and geese. Birds. Yeah. How many birds? Do, I know you're not a biologist. How many birds get banded in Canada and North America in a year? I couldn't tell you. I saw, I saw the uh, the Osborne Lab. They're out of Arkansas. Mm -hmm. I saw that they had banded. I think four thousand birds this year out of that lab. So, I mean, it's, and, and the bird, if you, if you ever done it, you ever put a band on or been on mm -hmm. one of those, the, the whole thing, it's the smoothest, quickest process there ever is. We would like an invite though. <laughs> Y'all can come up to Jack Miner. You gotta be on your best behavior though. You know how Canada is. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I've had a lot of trouble there. I already have a Andy's hard time Andy's been booted out. I, every time we go, I get pulled aside. Well, that's cause you, you broke the law and you got caught. I broke the law for you. Well, technically. Tech, well, no, it's not technical. There's no technicality <laughs> about it. That's what it was. 
Well, so you should be the one getting pulled out well, every time. Next time, I'm tell in. him. Yeah, it's it's the big guy in the back. It's his fault. Um, so how long, like, because they'll put the band on. Yep. They sex it. Don't they check it? Do they check it for diseases? They do. It depends on on, on when you're doing it. During avian influenza, they were doing a bunch of different stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the, the, they'll take some measurements, weigh the bird sometimes, uh, like wing cord length, all sorts of stuff. Put it on, write down that information, corresponds to the band, throw it up in the air, flies away, bird's gone. What? Three minutes, maybe? Uh, less. Less? Much less. Because you okay. do it with a team. You have a bander, and he's calling stuff out, and you've already read the tag. You've written it down, at least when I've done it. You've already written it down, put it on. The thing that takes a minute is you know uploading the data into Excel right. after you've done it. Now, are these backpacks or neck collars? That, so this one's Both. a neck collar. Right. Right. That's a neck collar. And then you put a gate on this side, right? Okay. Slide it right in. That's the backpack. That's and the it's backpack. sitting on, this is its charger. As long as it's sitting on there, it's not on. If you take, this is magnetic. As soon as you take it off, it turns on. And then, so this black part is the only part that goes on the duck. This white thing is just, it's, you know, it's charger. Okay. So, and it'll, and it's solar powered, so it keeps itself charged. Yep. The, kind of. a lot of the neck collars, yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of, yeah. the neck collars, a lot of them, the birds die before they can, they, the survival rate is not real good they on the had neck a, collars. They, they, those were those, uh, when they were banding with the neck collars, their water would come in there and it would freeze and it would kill them. Oh shit. That was, that was the problem they were having with those. That's not these neck collars. It's different, but you're right. Those were a bad deal. And that was killing a lot of geese. Yeah. A lot of geese died. I mean, the, the survival rate was really low on yeah. those. Where the water would get in, it would be, it would freeze up against their neck and they would die. I saw some guys the other day. Sometimes there's some waterfowlers that ain't really sharp out there. Right. I saw a picture the other day. Someone had a neck collar and it, or tarsal or something had numbers on it. They're like, they were making, what's that about? How, how can you tell? Well, people don't realize a biologist or a game warden or whatever can scan. They can look at a color and look at numbers and they can figure out exactly where that bird's at without having to shoot it and get back. Right. They're, they're color. They're Every color one of them is color coded yeah. and they got different numbers on them for different reasons. Right. I thought, like, use some fucking common sense people. Yeah. It's not hard. Y'all need to get some of the guys from some of these labs who are the PhD students from the Cohen lab from, uh, you know, Dr. Osborne, his lab, Michael Schumer up in New York, uh, Phil, yeah, he, for example, um, He's doing. He's the genetics guy. Yeah. In with his, his stuff is amazing. I Duck mean, DNA. Yeah, like a mallard's different here and there. Great mm-hmm. Lakes mallards. Two percent of ducks. Yeah, you, there's not very many pure mallards left. Right, especially on the east coast. No, and saying. that's what he was saying. In, around the Great Lakes, it's two percent. Yeah, two percent of them are pure wild with no game farm uh, genetics. And See, I didn't even know that existed. Until of talking to him, that I knew game farms existed, but I never thought about the interbreeding and it's stuff. It's really big on the east it's, coast. It's, it's it's crazy. I don't know if it's good or bad. So, uh, it's and that's the discussion, right? Because it changes, and you you know, again, this is his research. These are this is a a bunch of money, a bunch of super, people who are a lot smarter than me are doing research on that, and it, it depends on what you want, right? Because these game for farm birds are more like a chicken than a duck, based on how they right. feed and how they fly. And and they're they're you know interbreeding with wild ducks, and so it changes their migratory tendencies. Um, so it just, in my opinion, it's probably more bad than good. But again, it just depends on what you want. Well, uh, and I think he was telling us like I think it's made their beak shorter because going back to like what you were saying, like the the pen raised duck, it has it needs a beak for pecking, right? Instead of like getting down into the into the soil for food. So yeah. like the beaks, he's noticed. Over however many right. samples that he's looked at, the beaks are getting shorter. Yeah, exactly. and a mallard duck will screw anything. <laughs> they're, they, they, That's they, true. They're with the breeding with the black ducks and all sorts. Of, they'll, they'll do the anything. Hybrids, yeah. And when we were a kid, my neighbors had a lake house at Lake Kickapoo, and we'd go there a lot of times. And they had four, five, six ducks: uh-huh. Muscovy ducks, mallard hen, just right pet ducks. And old mallard Drake come in and they're coming here and land. Right. And them ducks would run him off, so he'd swim out, and them ducks would follow him out there to right. get him away from the hen. He'd fly back and screw the hen before they could squ- sw- They couldn't fly. Oh, they, and, right. And, you know, they'd try to swim back to him. Hell, he's on down the road by that time. But they'll breed with anything, so yeah. it's it's almost impossible to stop them from doing what they're doing. Right, with the game farm birds, for sure. But you go to any city, and there's tons of city ducks everywhere now. Right, and, I mean, is that a duck? Like, <laughs> It's a mallard. I mean, kind of. If it's got a band on it, it is. 
Well, that's one way to look at it. Because do you not look for bands when you see ducks in a park? No, for sure. Yes. I love to look at them. Yep. I love me. to look at them. And I would never shoot one. I know a lot of people will sneak back out there with a twenty two and kill one. Which... I wouldn't shoot one in a park, but I'd shoot it somewhere on a... If I was duck hunting and saw it and it come from that park, I'd shoot the shit out of it. Well, yeah, that's different. But, but yeah, I'm not going to... Like the guys that put vodka on bread and they get the geese over there and then grab the geese and take the bands off of them. Get them nice and drunk? Yeah, I don't... I, I, I just don't care about having a band that much. No, 100%. And, if, you know, if you're looking at birds on the ground and you got binoculars, I mean, you're looking for bands. And, and that oh, goes yeah. back to how they made it so cool, right? Like, why do we why do we care yeah. that much? It's just fun. It's at a golf course, I look at every goose on a golf course. 100%. Yeah. And that's a golf course goose, too. <laughs> yeah. And that's not a... Is that a goose? Well, like in Georgia, we have a tremendous number of uh, golf course geese. I won't call them a nuisance geese. Resident I mean, Canada's. Yeah, there you go. And they... Nobody, a lot of, especially if you live on a golf course, people do not like those. Mm -mm, they shit all over the place. 100%. And they're mean. Yeah. <laughs> Hiss at you. We had a good friend of ours went on a, uh, what do they call that? A nuisance goose season or a, whatever. Hunted on a golf course? And they hunted on, yeah, Ryan is up in Ohio and hunted. And he said like 20 guys went on this hunt and they're hunting on a country club and stuff. And everybody wants yeah. to put out, he said they bring up three or four trailers of shit. Put out a thousand birds. They put out a spread. A yeah, big old spread. He said, them, them geese come across like, what's going on? Where'd these guys come from? You know, whatever. The There's hell? 20 guys hawking. So guys are putting behind them. And they open up and shooting and killing geese. But that, that, I always, and the city of Wichita Falls did a deal. I don't know if, do you know about this deal? Mm -hmm. City of Wichita Falls has got four or 500 resident Canada's. Yep. I grew up in Wichita Falls. We didn't have any geese at all when I was a kid there. So it's taken place in the last 20 years. And they had enough that they had four or five hundred birds mm -hmm. that stay on a little lake right there at the university, right at Midwestern State University. Well, Midwestern got one of those geese out. They shit all over the walking paths, right. and so they brought in Texas Parks and Wildlife or somebody, and they had a trailer where they gassed them. So they put all these geese in this trailer and gassed and killed three hundred of them. And tried to sneak them off in the middle of the night. Well, Northwestern did. Midwestern. Midwestern university. did. I'm sorry. Oh yeah. Well, it backfired on them because everybody knew about it. Yeah. Now, what most people don't know. Like I would take, I would have taken six of those geese and put out here. We got a little pond out front and stuff. Yeah. But as soon as those geese got their molt wings, but their wings back, they gone back. they're going to fly right back to Wichita yeah, Falls because that's where they're from. Now, if you'd have got a newborn, new, a new, new hatch, new yeah. hatch, then you could have kept them here. Well, that's how they brought them to the state of Georgia. They had migratory geese and they clipped them, and so they had a you know a hatch here in Georgia. And then the the adult birds went back, but the hatch birds imprinted. And yes, that's why that's how they did it. But in a simple form. And, and now they, a bunch of those geese are back. You know, they don't have the numbers they had before. Right. But the bunny hugger person that d does not understand that they think that oh you should just giving them somebody else. They just stayed on my sister's pond at her house. Right. They wouldn't do that's that. That's not how that works. They're all going to go right back to where they were raised and they were brought up at. They have food there. People walk all the time there. They throw bread for them. They right. feed them all the time. Those birds have adapted to that. Yeah. There's also a flock of mallards in Wichita Falls that comes off the lake that are wild ducks. A guy feeds in his front yard. He feeds right. corn. Yeah. There'll be three or four or five hundred ducks, wild mallards, in his front yard yeah. when they're here during the wintertime. Yeah. And then they leave. And there's a bunch of them that stay all summer, too. Yeah. Once Those they are, find that food, I mean, they're they're going to come to it, especially if they're not getting bothered. Yeah. That's how I mean, it works. You're driving through a neighborhood, and there's all these ducks just coming in. The guy sits in his front yard and watches them every day. Yeah. I think that's neat. Yeah, I but, do, too. But... I could see where some neighbor that doesn't want duck shit all over does not like seeing three or four hundred mallards in his neighborhood. Right. It's like you walk out and there's a bunch of bird poo on your car. I mean, yeah. you know, you can kind of see it from that perspective. And but all the neighbors around there, all their flower beds have got nest in them when this time of year where they nest. Yep. And they, you know, they got to fight off the house cat. Right. But speaking of house cats, uh, I don't know. House cats for songbirds are the number one predator of songbirds. In the we, United States. we can't talk bad about cats. Andy's a cat person. Well, he was Fuck gone. He just got end. back. We could have done it quicker. Yeah. No, house cats. They'll they're he fucking they dec they decimate they decimate the bird population. I, Billions. I, I'm gonna well, miss, do. I'm gonna misquote the number, but it, I think well, it was I, a, it. I think it was the state of birds report reports that they killed two billion uh two billion birds. House cats have. Oh, I get. I fuck yeah. I'll go, I'll buy that. Could be One, just a completely made up number. 1.3 to 4 million birds each year in the U.S. alone. I figure it'd be more than that. I'm going to take the over on 1.3 million. Yeah, I am too. 1.3 to 4. I'll bet it's somewhere in the three. How many? 
1.3 to 4 billion birds each year. Oh, okay. Did I you, thought you said you say? million. Billion. Billion. Oh, yes. okay. Yeah, yeah you I'm said all, million. I, you, yeah. No, no, no. 1.3 to 4 billion birds. I was going to have to defend my stance no yeah. matter how wrong I was. Yes. If I was a thousand times over, no, yeah, it, I would have died on yes. that. I might have said I might have said a million. You said but million, but billion is what I figured yeah, it was going to no, be, too. It's with a B. Okay. They're, ter- they, they're, they're terrible on that. Even if that's not on your screen, I appreciate you saying it. It's there. I'll show it to you. Um, with 69% of these kills attributed to feral and unknown cats. Wow. They're awful. Okay. Well, we're They're talk- awful for fucking. Well, we're talking about other shit. stuff. I saw a picture yesterday of a bald eagle in a wind, wind farm. Yep. Dead. I don't like with bald eagles. Sorry. Not unpatriotic. I just, it's pretty why? unpatriotic. Why don't you like bald? E- What's your problem with bald eagle? They ruin good hunting places there. I just don't care much for them. Right. I really don't. I mean, I don't. I don't understand. Other weird, than being our patriotic bird, what good do they do? It's you know, a weird hill to die on, Jeff. Ben, ben Franklin wanted the turkey to be the. the I'm, thank God he I'm didn't. I'm with Ben. Thank God it's he didn't. It's a much we would, smarter bird. We wouldn't I be able to hunt him. Well, mm, good point. On the hunting part, other than that, but I'm not a bald eagle fan at all. Okay. But I saw them with a the wind farm. If that bald eagle would have been covered in oil and oil from a oil, that's all you'd have seen all over the place. Right. How many birds die from wind farms per year? Uh, it's as a, much as a cat? It's a staggering number. Yes, and they're okay. starting to do a bunch of studies on that, too. I mean, those wind farms are are, are bad for birds. And whales. And what? Whales. Have whales? you seen the ones off the East Coast? Oh, no. The, they're messing up their sonars. There's, like, orcas are swimming in, in humpbacks. And I am not. I don't know shit about whales. Uh-huh. But they're swimming into the beaches and getting stranded. And they say those all those turbines out there in oh, the wind. they're confusing them somehow. confusing the shit out of them. Hmm. Look no, up a stat. No look, idea about that. Yeah, look up and see how many whales. It sounds like something. Wind farm and whales. Wind farm and whales. There's all kinds of literature about it. Really? But it's a new thing now. But yeah. the bunny huggers, of course, the going green people won't talk about that. Right. Hmm. I hate, I'm not a wind farm guy. I'm glad it gives people the jobs that they have, but they move into area, they build these things, and they move down the road 100 miles. What's the deal with the wind farms out here? What's it, a 99-year land lease? Is that I, how they do them? I don't even know. Uh, they're an eyesore. I I saw a bunch m- of them driving in. My experience between Wichita Falls and Seymour on the Wagner Ranch, they're putting in 1,500 of them or something. Okay. That it, right where they've got the, they've got a big conglomerate deal. Did you come in that way today from Seymour to which Yeah, I've come from Dallas. When you come that way, they've got a in the nighttime, it's lit up like a city now, and it is a city. They probably got a thousand people working there, really, and it's it's just covered. They got gravel roads everywhere. They got trucks everywhere. They're put they're fixing to start putting all these. They're starting to stack where they're going to put all these. Uh-huh. You don't see no deer no more. No, but a, a long ten years ago, five years ago, when you left Holiday, Texas, and you drove to Seymour. You better be watching for deer. Yeah, they were all over the road. You don't see deer on the road there anymore at all. Yeah, I think they're bad news. I don't like them. Nobody out here that likes them except the people who are getting a paycheck. Right, and they're not getting as big a paychecks as they used to get. Well, it sounds like your wind farms or our solar farms. They're starting to put a lot of those. Solar in. Solar farms are worse than wind farms. They like if you say Can't solar, grow anything. No, it's barren. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing that lives in a solar farm. Isn't that a thirty year lease too on those? A lot of them are. And. Someone told me the other day they thought they was paying a thousand dollars an acre to the farmer. Is that it, right? It's a I can't, I can't speak to that. It's different different places, but it's a crazy number. If you have a hundred acres, well, it's a number where if you called me, you know, my principles would get tested really quickly. Yeah, you you own one hundred and sixty acres of land, and you're going to give me one hundred and sixty thousand a year, but I can't pass it down to my kids. There's nothing there to because I promise you, when this phase ends with the solar farms, those people ain't going to go pick all that shit up, and move it. Well, yeah, three to five hundred an acre. This says is what. What uh, solar pays per year, but that comes back to giving like wildlife a value. Like if right. that's what you're competing with as a landowner, it's I mean you you're gonna send your kids to college with solar farms, and right. you can't blame somebody for that. Five hundred right. an acre, you're you're getting eighty thousand dollars a year for one hundred and sixty acres. Yeah, if you get that every year, that's pretty good money. Sure. But what are you gonna leave your kids in twenty or thirty years when that land is worth? The ten million dollars you made in the stock market with that money every year. Yeah, that, I mean that's what you got. I mean that's that's what how you look at, at it. But yes. yeah, I'm with you 100. percent Like in the long term, those are not good for the landscape. It, they are not good for the no, landscape. At least the wind energy. We've duck hunted and goose hunted around a lot of wind farms, mm-hmm. and and then it hasn't well, bothered to. nothing. You have to, and, but it hasn't. I've not seen bar. I see deer around. Some of them around here. I see deer and stuff, yeah. but I'm not seeing anything on the Wagners anywhere. So if I had to choose between solar and wind. I'd rather have a windmill on my land. I don't want none, neither one. Did of them. you see? I'd rather have an oil well. That one solar farm got wiped out in this yes. last hailstorm. Yes, I can't remember how much it was, but you think they're going to go fix it? I don't know how they. I mean, I don't know. It Ooh. screwed some shit up. It, 
this makes me sound like a real jackass, which I sound that way already. I'm sure I'm going to catch shit over me talking about Atlanta because I always do when I say something about Atlanta. But you can go to Nevada. Mm -hmm. You can go west of Salt Lake City, and you can see all the barren bullshit land you want to. Build solar farms for the whole state of Nevada. Yeah. That land is not worth anything. I hate to, If you live in Nevada, I'm not trying to hurt your feelings. It is a shithole. It's an ashtray that you live by. Right. And if Las Vegas, if they didn't have re prostitution and gambling in Nevada, nobody would go there. Well, that's true. I mean, they built they built it in the desert for a reason because yes. the land was cheap. Right. So how it started. Put mirrors all over that place. Yeah. But Elon Musk said that, didn't he? Yeah, I'm pulling that clip up right now. But you're right. You're why why not put it there instead yeah. of South Georgia? United States with uh, 100 miles by 100 miles of solar. Really? Yeah. So you can just pick some dead spot that you fly which, over. Oh, which plenty. Cover that sucker up with right. solar panels and charge the whole country. Absolutely. 24 hours. You need batteries, but yeah. Yeah. That's going to be the hard part. Wow. Yeah, it's not hard. 100, I mean, it's 100 by 100. So like he said, I think he said that in this clip, pick a, pick a corner in Nevada. That's the place to go. Anything. There's no. nothing there. Even, Don't do it on the fertile ground. Even the eastern side of California the, the, around Death Valley and stuff. Right. Same way. There's a lot of places. You can go to some places in West Texas out between El Paso and, but now they got oil wells, oil under it. But right. there's places that we could go the without problem, Georgia. The problem is the batteries. No, not, well, that's a big problem. Getting the shit where it needs to go. When the government gets involved with anything, it automatically becomes screwed up. We wouldn't have wind energy if it wasn't for the government because the government subsidized I understand all this that. shit. That solar is so subsidized too. Like once, putting solar panels on your house. Once the government, yeah. like he says 100 by 100, but there's no way in hell that all that power gets to where it needs to go. Well, no. We're going to be subsidizing the power to go somewhere else. I say burn that coal. Well, I mean, that's the most. Arkansas. Easiest way. Right. A gentleman called me last year from Arkansas, and I wish I could remember his name, and he's going to listen to this because he listens because he calls me sometimes. I'm like, sorry, but I can't remember your name. Lives in northwest Ark, somewhere around the Memphis area. Okay. Big duck hunting area. Mm -hmm. He said in his neighborhood, or not his neighborhood, his farms where he lives at, they're fixed to start putting in some solar farms. He said like 2,500 acres. Really? They're going to take rice out and put in solar farms. Oof. You're talking about killing some duck habitat. Yeah. And that's not just a one-year deal. No, and there ain't no deal. ducks landing around that in solar farms. Yeah. So I don't know. This well, solar deal that you saw with the hell, too, did you see that guy talking about that? That The temperature around them is going to be higher than it is somewhere else. They said it's going to intensify the so, the thunderstorms. I don't. I kind of I think it's kind of like on the wind. I think we're I think we're making these things bigger than they really are. I don't think 100 acres of solar farms are going to make the temperature heat up enough to cause a thunderstorm to change. Right. But I wonder if that would be the reason to not put it, like he said, like 100 by 100 in one spot. It'd be a hot bitch flying over that in a jet. Fucking microwave right there. Yeah, it would be. So yeah. maybe that's why they, it's better to space them out. That would have some long, know. that would have some major effect on storms, I think, 100 by 100 miles by 100 miles. You get a lot of heat in there. That's going to, you would really have some severe storms. Right. Or it would get so hot that it would screw up cold. I, I mean, I, that's that's playing with Mother Nature a little bit. That's a big, that's a pig area. That's yes. a lot. But 1,500, 1,500 wind farms on a half million acres <clears throat> at the Wagner Ranch is not going to change any of the dynamics of the storms, no. I don't think. I wouldn't think so. <clears throat> but, has, has there been anything since you've started this where, like, it changed your changed the way you thought about the way a duck moves or anything? Yeah, they they move a lot more, especially on their their migratory movements. They do a lot more of it at night. Um, oh, really? Like fat dad, we, I put a bunch of it on the, in, the Instagram and written about it a good bit. And again, take everything I say with a grain of salt. I'm not a biologist, but uh, 95 percent of its lifetime movement was done from sunset to sunrise. 95 percent, and a lot of that is because of migratory move. These long, you know, 600 mile movements in a day. Mm -hmm. uh, they go a lot faster and they fly a lot higher um, than I previously thought as well so why do you think the do you think they can see better at night you know i don't know why they they migrate at night that's your guess is as good as mine as to why less that traffic because <clears throat> i've always wondered that too because like you'll go to you'll you'll be you'll ride around these back areas because like where we hunt it's basically a 20 mile circle mm -hmm. anything in that you know so it's scouting is very very easy here but like one day you're riding around, you don't see anything. Next day you show up and they're here. Right. So it's like, well, they came at night. Right. And then like that's when you hear them. Whenever you step outside, it's at night. There are a lot of people who are building uh, these predictive models. Um, uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, a bunch of guys are trying to figure to, to build these models, and a lot of it has to do with uh, on the East Coast, especially. It has to do with with temperature and, and snow 
snow cover as to predictive models that help determine <laughs> when birds move. I think that is super fascinating. I've got gone down that rabbit hole too. Right. I think that's is the next generation of what duck hunters want to see is predictive modeling on it simplified and showed yeah. to you. What shocks me is how much east to west movement there is. Yes, that surprised me as well. Yeah, I was just thought a duck went from north to south. Now, now you know, five miles here, right, ten miles here. But when you see a, a goose that's here and they go to the Arkansas right. for a week and then they come back, yeah. like what the hell? What makes you go? Those arteri- arteri- arterial flyways. Uh, the wood ducks in in Georgia do that too. They have a, a bunch of west migration. You know, local wood ducks are going east west too. It's it's very cool. Back in the seventies, there used to be a flock of uh, snow geese, probably in the, even in the eighties, that stayed at Hagerman Wildlife Refuge by Sherman. Mm-hmm. They would fly down the the Red River and they would go to the the Wagner Ranch. And the Wagner Ranch used to have a big a big wheat field, and they still do. <clears throat> but I think it was 10, 10 miles by thirteen miles. So sixty thousand acre wheat field. Yeah, and they they cross fenced it back in the day. They didn't even cross fence it. Imagine driving a tractor around that sucker one day to make one lap. But anyways, the 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 snow geese would go from Hagerman, fly down the red the Red River, land on that wheat field, and then go back every night. Now you can't tell me they can't find a wheat field somewhere between that wheat field to go to. Yeah, but it's just weird how the birds had. A, but they would do that track every day. Yeah, it's crazy. And, and I think a lot of it, again, you know, speaking from what I know, is when they find a place that's safe and has food, like they stay in that pattern until they have to move. You thought they'd found water closer, though. Right. That, that's just crazy, but how they do they stuff. Weigh, the way they move is is, is fascinating. Yeah. Here's your Tundra Swan. We, we skipped over the Tundra Swan. Yeah. That son of a bitch put in the miles. The 37,000 miles. 37,000 miles over four years. Is I'm pretty sure is what he that did now too. Yeah, this was a this was a USGS study. This is repurposed data. We had no part in in banding this. Uh, if he got all. shot, um, but no, he was banded up. You see, in Alaska, made his way to North Carolina. That one came back within 300 yards of where it was banded uh, one year. Went all the way to North Carolina, came back within 300 yards. <laughs> it's crazy. I mean, and that's the stuff that, like I'm saying, with repurposing this data, right? Like I have nothing to do with this tundra swan, yeah. at all, right? Uh, but but people. I mean, you know, who knew that a tundra swan flew 37,000 miles over four years? I didn't. Now, here you go. And he got within 300 yards of where he was banded. Uh-huh. Fucking crazy. The next year. The next year. The next year. North Carolina and back. Where did he quit transmitting at, this last one? Uh, in North Carolina. The the icon is the last known location, and then the red dot in the top left-hand corner is the start location. And we're constantly working on these maps. We're going to filter in some some time you know, filters where it's a little more like year by year, week by week type stuff. I wonder if in the three year times, the, the three trips back and forth, if he stayed in the same place the same night other than where he was banded. We did. I'm pretty sure it was uh, th- number 38. I, I did an Instagram post that broke one of them down uh, pretty specifically on, on where it went and, and its flight paths. But as you can see, I mean, it's it's, it's pretty similar pretty year close. over year. Did, did, one year he went to Toronto, though. Did he do that every year? Or was that just a... I'm pretty sure, and, and I haven't looked at this bird in a couple of weeks, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that was a year or two. Um, it, there, there were some small differences in their movement every year, but... Well, I mean, like, that's 2009, and then that's 2011. So right. two years, he's flying basically the same path. I wonder what this one is. 2010, maybe he took a different different route. That's just, that is absolutely crazy. 2009. And we got a lot more of this data that we don't have on the website right now. There's, you know, uh, as you can imagine, with 3 million data points on the map, you can crash a website pretty easily, and I've done it a couple of times now. <laughs> so we got to be real careful with how we upload uh, this data, and we do it in waves, and uh, so that takes a tremendous amount of time. But we have the data on uh, about 1,200 birds right now. we got 500 of them on the site because you have to, Dance a fine line between the website running quickly and having all the data. Someone the other day did someone killed a pintail that was banned in Japan. I saw really, and I can't. Remember. It was on. I was on Instagram the other day. Someone had killed one. I think it was in California. Did you have you all seen the Garden and Gun article? Uh, I think it was Paul Link who banded a uh, a, a pintail, um, and it flew. It banded it in Louisiana, and it flew into Siberia. Whoa came back and landed in a California prison yard. What? And that goes with those cell service. Like, that bird was gone for nine months, right? No transmission. You don't know if the bird's dead or alive. You don't know where it is. You just think it might be in Prairie, Canada, reappeared in a California prison yard. They wrote an article about it in Garden and Gun. It's a, I haven't read it in 
probably a year, but it's a great read. We had a guy that shot a banded speckle belly here in the early nineties that was banded in Russia. Yeah. And you know, cause but, but it's a close line. I mean, there's Alaska and Russia is not that, I mean, it's far no. apart, but by bird miles, you know, especially when you get to that little part right there, there's that, I don't know how far apart that is, but I bet it's not four or 500 miles. There's some birds on our map that were banded in pintails banded in Japan that made it uh, to Alaska. And then there were um, some eiders and some scoter that were banded in Alaska that were kind of be bopping back and forth between Russia. Now, in Japan, are they flying across the Pacific or are they going up? No, they're they going up. And, and most up and of the down. ones, I think of the, I think about 105 of them on our map um, that they did in this study. It was a USGS study uh, in conjunction with the whatever the federal agency is in Japan. Um, only one of them made it to Alaska because they were trying to see if there was any interconnectivity between Japanese pintail and your West Coast Alaska pintail populations. That was the point of that study. So some of that data is on the map just because it's fun. It's in Japan. It's in a different part of the world. Somebody, mm -hmm. I had a guy that was hunting with us last year. Tell me him and his wife were on a cruise between Cancun and Galveston and a flock of blue winged teal flew over. Yeah. Well, and uh, some of those blue winged teal on our map, um, they have, they fly over the Gulf of Mexico. One of them quite literally left from uh, Orange Beach, Alabama, and its next stop was in Cuba. I was like over the Gulf, and that, they sh they've shot some blue winged teal in Colombia, I believe, that were banded in America a few times. In oh, in South America, yes. yeah, they go all the way down. Some of them make it to to Brazil. I mean, they go all over the place. That's I why think blue winged teal are a, a fascinating. Bird. They, they are, and I believe teal season should open September first and end the end of September. Yeah, because most blue winged teal don't even get hunted anyways. Yeah, the biggest majority of them go to Mexico, and there's no pressure. I know people will be like, "We well, can shoot two hundred in Mexico." The, the bird numbers down there that get killed there they're just not very many of them are the, i mean do you see when you've been down to mexico does anybody talk about hunting these birds that come down there at the uh at nova uh nova placha uh my mike Krizwicki, that's his he has a big uh he's a boise state researcher mentioned him earlier he's uh helps run that field station around where he is there's there's a pretty good bit of uh of hunting mostly for pintails a lot of pintails there um, and you say a lot, like, it's not like a lot of hunting like there is here, but right. there are hunters throughout the season kind of near him. Right. But it's not like it is here. No, not, not even. I mean, if you look at the, the total, and this goes back to what you were saying, if you look at total, total birds killed in the U S Canada, and Mexico, uh, Mexico is an inconsequential number. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's yeah. absolutely zero. I mean, they just don't kill very many. And the guys that kill them kill a bunch. Right, yeah, because the limit's, what, 25? And you come back to, you know, I don't know how I feel about that, good, bad. But, again, it comes back to putting a value on the bird and making it a worthwhile thing for people in Mexico to manage for them. Mm -hmm. So everything's not as simple as they're killing 25, you know, pintails a day in Sonora. Well, what would happen to that land if you didn't have American hunters going there? Yeah. So there's, I mean, you know, there's about, and, you know, if I went to Mexico, I don't know if I would kill... 25 ducks in a day, but if I was in the blind and fun, I can't, again, my moral stance will get tested. <laughs> Thank, things have changed. Depends on how they're decoying. Things have changed so much. I'm writing a book, and in my book, I'm trying to write it based on 1963. Because okay. the first part of my book is, this book is going to be based in 1963, but I'm about to punt on that because it's so hard. Mm -hmm. But coming up with data from 1963 with hunting regulations, because I hate to watch a TV show. And a flock of geese fly over, and it's quacking. Quack, 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 quack. Right. Ain't a fucking duck. That's a goose. You know. Does somebody working at Hollywood not know what the difference is? No. So I want my. I don't want someone to pick apart a book and say, "Well, he had his numbers right." Right. Hunting seasons in the '60s and stuff were completely different than they are now. Well, they were uh, real small. Well, and the way people viewed the resource was completely different. Take Cameron Pet Parish in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. They and and again, this is. The anecdotal data, but they said that the illegal harvest in Cameron pa Parish was more than the rest of con the country's legal harvest for a number of years there when duck numbers were crazy in Louisiana. I'm couldn't ask this kid the shit out of him. Yeah. You want to get rid of something? You tell somebody from Louisiana they're illegal and they taste good and they're gone. <laughs> I've heard that. They say that when I'm in Venice every but, year. But people ate kill to eat. Yeah. You know, in, 19, in the middle of the 60s, how many people do you think even had a deep freeze in their house? Right. Well, it's a different time. I mean, you can't compare the two, and, and the habitat was so much more. No. The numbers were yeah. different. It was yeah. a different type deal. Uh, 
Roy Carter had put on on one of his social deals. He was talking about the duck numbers in Kansas where he's at. My dad grew up in southeast Kansas. They didn't have the duck numbers they do. Yeah. Well, now they have the food and the water there. Right. And back then, there wasn't food everywhere. So they had to have winter push the birds down. But it wasn't just winter. It was food. Right. If you was in North Dakota and you ran out of food to eat, you went on down south. Right. Well, nowadays, there's food opened all the time. It's not just the hot water stuff. Right. That There's just more food than there used to be. Yeah. And Louisiana doesn't have the food they had in the 60s. Well, they have, they've had all that marsh get killed from the oil, from the canals they dug with the oil. Uh, I mean, that just absolutely. And sugar cane. And sugar cane. Yeah, they didn't have sugar cane in the 60s Oh, much. right. I'm with you. They had rice. Right. All right. Rice, corn, milo, they had grain. Yeah. There's not a lot of grain down there anymore. Yeah. The the saltwater intrusion just absolutely has obliterated their coast. And there's not much. I mean, once you dig those canals and all that water starts coming in, your brackish water becomes salt water and your fresh water becomes brackish water. I mean, it, it's a problem. It, it, it is a, it's a big ecological disaster that's happened down there. Yeah. I read a book called The Chaffalion Basin one time. It was a really interesting book yeah. about the lifestyle down there. Yeah. I said, my favorite people in the world are people from southern Louisiana. They had the best food in the world. I love the way they talk. Man, it's fun. They're there. outdoorsmen. Mm -hmm. They just Your grandpa's down there, right? So my, my mom's family is from Baton Rouge. I got a bunch of family still in Baton Rouge. Um, uncle, a bunch of cousins. That is a, the neat, and they made the most out of living in a freaking swamp. They sure have. I, and I don't, I don't like snakes, and I don't like alligators, <laughs> and I don't like mosquitoes. <laughs> there ain't, if you drop me off... I would rather get dropped off in the woods, probably in Alaska. I think I would rather try to fight a grizzly bear with a switch than have to have to live in the swamps of Louisiana with alligators and snakes. What about you, Andy? I don't know, man. There's been time like when when you leave uh, New Orleans and you come back this way, and like it's just marsh, 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 a little bit of land, marsh. I don't know how anybody survived that. No, I mean, and like you're talking about bugs and snakes and gators and just everything there is just awful and i'll tell you the thing that surprised me about how much like when you think of new orleans you think like that's it you can go a long yeah. way south of new orleans yeah we, we went to venice we went to venice last yeah. year when we ran up on the sandbar mm. oh really yeah <laughs> or uh when a sandbar it was a uh, mud flat mud flat yep we almost yeah. lost our good buddy dirk sorrels there because i was gonna pay him a hundred dollars to swim across the canal and there were some gators there and he was thinking about it that had been a big mistake on his part, bro. Hundred bucks. We were uh, we were trying to go bow fishing, mm -hmm. and um, you have to do. It. Evidently, the tide went out. Didn't know about it, and we were kind of going to where the guide had seen a bunch mm -hmm. and <laughs> buried it. But we had Jeff. We had our cameraman, who is another large fella. So we all stood on the front of the boat to kind of oh, to kind of get that motor up just a little bit to where. And we were worried though. No cell phones were working. And the guy goes. I've got a mosquito net for it to spend the night. I'm like, whoa, whoa hold on. What this spend the night bullshit? <laughs> Where'd that come from? <laughs> Is there somebody we can whack, flag down? We never even seen another boat. No. The whole afternoon. We were lucky we got off, but <laughs> he did exist. I got a mosquito night if we have to spend the night out here. I thought, screw that shit. <laughs> I don't know what we would have done. Shoot a flare up? I don't I, I, I have legitimately yeah. we might don't know. still be there. I don't know. Because, I mean, you can't push off though, right? Because you just go up to like your waist in mud. You get in that, you just sink, yeah. <laughs> it would have been a long night. When those guys drop us off uh, at the blinds with the guys we go with, the one thing they say is do not get out of the blind. Don't. Like, don't get out. You can't walk. Like you say, you'll just sink. You'll just sink. Yeah, you can't. You know. Oh, so I, I was thinking gators. They just said no, don't do just, it because you, you'll sink. Yeah. Mm, that's that's one of my fears. Um, we were hunting. There's a place up here called Truscott, and we were we were walking back. I wasn't on there this. I wasn't there this day, but... Um, there's like sinkholes mm -hmm. and you just walk because you knee deep water, you know, not very deep ankle in some spots, but you just kind of walk. And then, uh, they were going to the spot and one of their, they're just kind of all going and then they lose a guy and they look at him and he's up to his waist just fell and they're scrambling to get like sticks and shit and limbs to pull them out. Right. But I don't know, but like they, they, you got to stay calm, I guess, which I wouldn't have done. I'd have been flailing <laughs> around and. Next thing you know, I'm at my waist, and then I'm up to here. But that's not a way that I want to die, especially in Louisiana, because then your top half's going to get eaten by mosquitoes, and it'd be a it'd be a tough situation. You know, Alaska's got some places like that where the 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 sea goes in and out, and they get people. Matter of fact, it's so bad in one area, their fire department has got a hose that they, that shoots air, compressed air down in it with water to blow this an area around your feet where they can get you out. Because people have drowned in that deal, like getting clams and shit, and they get stuck. And 
One really? guy I saw they had to tie his ass up to like a four wheeler and stuff and drag his ass, pull, pop him out. I saw a video on how to get out of a uh, grain bin if you ever get caught in one of those with corn coming in on top of you. You're basically screwed, pretty much. You try to get to the top? No, oh, no, you can't dig your way out. What do you do then? You said you saw a way to get out. What yeah, do you I do? Want the, I'm waiting for the yeah, tutorial. Like, like, well. like lay on your back and just hope that your buddy knows that you're in there. Otherwise, you're fucked. That's the answer? That's the answer. <laughs> That's not much of an answer. No, I thought you had like some swim method or oh, something. Oh, no, 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 no. There's no method. <laughs> Everybody in, cra- in grain country was like, oh, I'm going to listen to this and get a tip no, here. No, 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 there's no method. Like if it starts dumping in on top of you, because they said what will happen is like there will be like air pockets underneath mm-hmm. to where like the corn hasn't been. So like if you start pushing around, basically all you do is you just push that corn down into there and you just sink further and further. Mm-hmm. Your only bet is to stay calm, but they said once it gets to your chest, you're dead because it, as you breathe, it'll just slowly like to start. It'll just start. So there's no way you. of moving around to go to the top. No. See, I thought that was like a water. If you get caught in water deal like that, you just ride your way up to the top and hope to hell somebody turns a water valve off. Best thing you can do is like create as much surface area as you can and just pray to God that your buddy quits notices dumping, you're missing. Quits, quits dumping corn on you because you're pretty well screwed. Mm. Yeah. So. No, don't 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 get stuck in the in the grain bin. Learn something every day. Yeah, you're screwed. What's been your favorite duck to uh, track? What what I really, I mean, it's it's also cool, and you learn so much from it. Uh, to this point, we've done a bunch of teal. Uh, the, the big ducks will come this fall. Yeah, and so I'm super excited about that. I'm super excited that uh, that next year well, we've got it lined up to ban some pintails um, down there in Mexico with Tierra Davis, and you just don't know. I mean, we got a bunch of balls in the airs with some. Uh, some researchers here in the U.S. and and we just don't know what's going to fall into place. But uh, it, I mean, every time, you know, I get attached to them. And the, the one thing I will say about it is, I, I'm a hunter and I like to hunt, but I do find that I get a lot more excited now when we band them mm-hmm. than I do when we then we hunt them. Yeah. And I am starting to get a little soft about killing them, just from dealing with them. Yeah, Miss Quack duck Quack. So you know, yeah, she's I, it, I, on somebody's table. I'm drinking my own Kool Aid. But I I'll, sh- sh- I'll shoot a duck. I don't care about shooting a goose. What do you yep. mean? Oh, just in general? I don't care if I ever shoot another goose in my life, but I like to shoot ducks. Yeah. Well, I say that. When we was in Saskatchewan, we shot the shit. I had, well, hell, both of our Canada trips, I had a great time. Yeah. I, I enjoyed shooting the geese up there. I just don't, I don't get as excited about shooting a goose as I am a duck. Yeah. And don't get me wrong. I like, I still, I still like to kill a duck. It's just, it becomes my, what I enjoy about them is starting to change. The I love process. to, I love to look at a duck and see a duck. A duck in the air, especially when they whiffling in, I mean, it's, mm-hmm. there's just something about it that you can't explain to somebody that, that doesn't do it. They're such quirky little fuckers, too. But they're just... They're, they're, they're so cool. They're magic. Yeah, I I talked to a man that's in a whole bigger tax bracket than me this weekend, big, big money guy, mm-hmm. and we talked about duck hunting and how it brings people together. Yeah. If you walk in someone's house and they got some duck prints on the wall, that's a duck hunter. And you can talk and you have something in common. For sure. I mean, and just... You see deer horns everywhere. If I went right. into a house, somebody's got a deer horn up or a deer, I don't think much of it. Right. But if I see a duck print yeah. in a business, I'm like, oh, do you duck hunt? Yeah. You know, and you, you have. It's a cult. It, it, it is. A, it is a cult. It's a cult, There's for lack no, of a better word. Waterfowl hunters are a unique breed of people, yep. but they have something in common. And they're, 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 just, they're just different than any other. It's just they're an amazing group of people to be around. And, and they care about the ducks. And for they sure. want to see ducks. Yep. And. When, would there ever be a way, and maybe this is dumb, but would there ever be a way to like sponsor a duck? Thousand dollars for the telemetry unit, and some of the research that goes into it, and like Absol- that would be your absolute, duck? absolutely. As long as the organization that we're you know starting to do it with, you know, is in the right place, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely I thought about do schools doing that. So that's what we were talking about about letting the kids name the ducks. The only thing you got to be careful with ducks is some of them aren't going to live very long, right? And so, you know, you do have a problem with. Uh, with giving the kids a single duck and it's you know dead it's <laughs> like six weeks later you gotta have a few to, to right. there needs to be another so, miss quack quack on deck like larry cable guy talked about adopting the little kid over in africa and damn kid i adopted he tore up a bunch of shit I just <laughs> bills for it. but yeah you that would be a bad deal but i just think that would be so cool no, you're right like if if our elementary in knox city let's say they got andy's on school board Seven classes between the elementary class, whatever it is. Yeah. And each class paid twenty dollars to sponsor a duck yeah. a piece. And they had a contest on who traveled the most, blah, blah, blah. And make it a whole year round thing with 100%. them. hundred percent. And you can yeah. do it's a built in science project. What yes, your duck it is. do that the other did? Um and we've got on our website, we have a bunch of resources for teachers that are plug and play. 
uh, where you can do a classroom activity with our map. Um, and, and we won't ever take, like, uh, to sponsor a duck from a classroom, you just got to email me and understand that the duck could die. <laughs> and I'll name, you know, we can name some ducks after you this fall, and that's fine. Right. Um, yeah, no, that's a that's something we've talked about. And I think, it's it, again, it's a way to make the duck feel like it's those kids' bird. Yeah. So, absolutely. How big of a pain in the ass was the back end of all this? Like we're seeing the the finish, the you know the polished product, and yeah. you know we weren't there for the two years of headache. I get and I get lost into it because I look at it and think about it all day, every day, and and I still get irritated with some of the stuff like I'm looking at here that you wouldn't notice. I think um, it looks great. Yeah, well, and 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 I have to take a step back, and and it is it is great, and there's a lot that went into it. Um, it was it's a lot more expensive, and it took a lot longer than we thought it would. Did you build the program? No. Had a lot of help. I built the website. Um, do you for, own the rights to the programming that you do on this, though? I, I have a company that we do a lot of work with. Because what do you, I don't. What do you mean? Well, this the, is my map. The yes. guys, the guys who came up with the model computer plan for uh, what's the car deal that you ride? Uh, Uber. Uh huh. I think they sold the shitload just because of their computer program, right? And and think Grubhub and a lot of those companies like right. that. Those guys made all their money by selling that computer program. Hundred percent. Yeah. So. Maybe you're sitting on a gold mine you don't know about. Well, if you can tell me how to I don't a bunch know of money shit. from it, I'll get you a check in the mail tomorrow. Well, <laughs> if I could, I would cash that check, but I don't. But I just know that a lot of people that have had these deals Our, have written computer programs. It's made like Microsoft or somebody comes up and says, oh, right. we could sell that to the U.S. Army or something to make a whole lot more money off of it. Right, so. and, and the, the, the value you're talking about there is uh, data has value, and especially in today's day and age. And it's a tremendous amount of work to to get the data that we get into repurpose it and, and – um, you can do a lot of uh, of stuff with that data as far as licensing it to people a lot smarter than me who can build predictive modeling, stuff like that, um, certainly. And our ultimate goal would be to, to be a data repository for anyone who's doing telemetry work in the world that believes in our mission um, and we can work the finances out you know, with all of those guys and how much money they need for fundraising where they're banding birds and we're putting it on you know, our website and then we're talking about what they're trying to do and just driving eyes to what they're doing, trying mm -hmm. to raise more awareness for what they're about. Well, I think you got into a cool deal. I love the, that educational purposes that the schools could use with this. Yeah. And I'm betting you there's some teachers that are listening to this right now they're thinking, you know what, we're doing that next fall with our kids, and we're going to get them involved. Yeah. Because you can make a competition between the other classes. Oh, yeah. And you know what? If Miss Wiffles or Waffles dies, it's no different than having your kid in ag classes. That's part of life. It I is, mean, for sure. Life and death is part of it. And That's why the hermit crab was a class pet for a long time. Those fuckers live forever. <laughs> and it, and you're not going to realize it. You know, your teacher puts another one in there, and you're like, oh, yeah. Herbie's still there. And who has to take him home in the summer? Uh -huh. And who has to take him home in the summer? You get a new one come in the fall. Yeah, exactly. I, this is. I grew up as a kid loving the Ducks Unlimited. I used to love the Green Wing part of it because right. absolutely. And so this is just another. This is a lot better version of that because as a kid I would read the little maps where it was banded and I was just so fun. And 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 you know kids especially these days are so much better at technology uh, than adults. And and the map is going. We're we're going to build some interfaces with it where it's super. Like, if you're really good at technology, you can really get in the weeds and play with it. Um, we're, we're working on that now. But but you're right. The, 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 that's our that's our crusade. That's our charitable crusade is from this educational component. Um, and I think we can do a lot of good with it. How so, do people get a hold of you? Uh, you can follow us on the Instagram. Uh, you can send me an email, Greer, G-R-E-E-R, -E -E at 50ducks, with an S, dot com, 50ducks.com. And what's your Instagram? It's 50ducks North America. And then the Facebook is just 50ducks. What? Uh, who's doing your Who's doing your uh, blogs? Most I like these. most everything you see that's written, I've I've written. I got some uh, some guys that help me with some uh, you know SEO optimization type stuff. But most of the things you read that are written, I've written. From talking to you and listening to you, we've had a lot of people sit in that chair. You're a pretty bright guy, I can tell. I'm very educated. Well, I appreciate it. What's your background? I put on a good facade. You've done a good <laughs> job, then. Georgia, where'd you go to college at? I went to the University of Georgia. Uh, Born in Macon, went to the University of Georgia, uh, graduated, uh, taught school and coached football for a year, and then I joined uh, Corporate America. I worked for a company that um, built an algorithm, and we went into big buildings and figured out how to save money on power. Uh, just based on their usage, you can – Georgia Power has – it's kind of a different type power company. But that's what I did for a while, and, you know, it was fine. It was a good job. Um, I got in pretty early with it, but, I mean, it was Corporate America, and – um, I did, I worked for a biotech company after that, 
um, again. That was one of those things where I sat in Zoom meetings and I had to Google words as we were having the meeting. I mean, those guys were so much smarter than me. And it just never was what, you know, my heart was really in. And so this has given me, I mean, it's a blessing and it hasn't worked yet, but, you know, I'm doing it. Uh, my dad is getting close to retirement. He's an attorney and he's going to come on board. I got some great wildlife biologists from the state of Georgia helping me. And, and you know, I've made contacts around the world who are doing this and, uh, it's been it's been really fun to try and get it off the ground. Well, you're a sharp guy. There's no doubt about it. And find you something you love to do it makes things a lot better. Yeah. I bet you enjoyed football coaching a lot more sitting in corporate world, but don't pay near as good. Yeah, it, it was a it was a lot more fun. You lose. I'll tell you this too. Like as you become an adult, you lose that competitive outlet that you had as a kid mm -hmm. in sports, and so it, you have to find a way to do it. Um, at least I do, and this kind of gives me that because it is you know, a conservation-based educational thing, but it's also, you know, a business and you have to make it work and you have to make the numbers work too. And so I've enjoyed that. I mean, it's, it's very competitive, right? I mean, you have to, you know, a lot of, there, you get told no a lot more than you get told yes. We had a professor from Georgia not long ago. Mike Chamberlain, the, the turkey guy, turkey doctor. Yep, familiar of him. Uh, he, he and uh, a guy who, who's on our team, Reggie Thaxton, who is the Bob White Quail and turkey guy in Georgia. Um, I, I'm pretty sure they know each other. Mike's a good. He was a very interesting guy. He was. Uh, he was talking about because we were. They geotagged a bunch of turkeys and. Yeah, that's <clears> fascinating. <throat> something about he had to hunt them because like the geo tag, the tags were about to go expire. I don't. Anyway, the gist of it was they recovered all but one, and they were uh, like they had real time data. Like they knew exactly where this bird was. Couldn't kill him. Really. He said it was, he said he looked over at the student that he was hunting with. He's like, this has not been fun. This has been just miserable. He's Turned like, into a job, huh? Cause, yeah, because he's like, I know the motherfuckers, he's over there 50 yards. I know he is. I yeah. see it. He's right here. He's, he's pinging right now. He's like, what the hell? Yeah. He's like, this has not been enjoyable. Because I was like, boy. Too much information. Yeah, because I was like, I wonder if I would enjoy turkey hunting more if I knew the bird was close. And he was like, I can answer that. He's like, it's no. Yeah. He's like, it was not an enjoyable hunt. Yeah. But there is something about, like, you know, the uh, the surprise of it all. Like, if you know he's going to pop his head around the corner, or if you're hunting a, a pond, I guess you'd kind of be, it might be different with ducks because right. it's a lot of big flocks. Yeah. So knowing that, like, hey, there was a, some, a geo geotag here. So how's that going to work? You well, said it's going to be how long after before they get like real time data? So it's when the bird is is completely gone for its location. Uh, we randomize the data, and when that bird is dead, it will get put onto right or when zoom all the way in, or after sixty days and it's left. We'll okay. do it either way. But there's a lot of site fidelity with a lot of these birds too. So if the duck's coming back to the same place next year, we're gonna have to take it down. We're gonna have to play with that a little bit because because these right. we, we can't have people you know, being able to target these birds. So we think we might not put the exact data on there until that bird has, you know, died. But like you say, to the thing of what's fun about it is the surprise of it all. Yeah. You know, we're building an app. We'll have a, an app here in, I don't know, this next it, within the year for sure to, to get on your phone, to look at it, and to see where the duck has gone. Mm -hmm. Overnight, like you got a cold front, you know, in the prairies, and you're like, oh, a bunch of the ducks have moved. Uh, that's the fun part to me, more than just the science. It's when we had, you know, when we were building this back and we had a couple of ducks on there, is to wake up and to look and just be like, oh, you know, they're moving north. Mm -hmm. Or, or, or oh, we lost one in, in cell service. I wonder where it's going to pop back up. Right. So uh, the surprise of the whole thing is, is the novel aspect of it that makes it so fun. So you're getting that, like, you're getting that all the time now. You're getting to see the migration all the time, uh -huh. seeing where it's at. Yep, and everyone will this fall. That's everyone crazy. Fall. That That's really, really fun to think about. Yeah, it is fun, and, and it's... Because there's, you know, you're always sitting around with your buddies, like, oh, I wonder, I wonder how far the birds made it down. Right. Now you're going to be able to know. Now you'll know. And and it's and it's specific enough where you'll know that. Like, you you know, the bird was in Devil's Lake. Now mm -hmm. it's in Stuttgart. Wow. You know, right. or now, you know, we're midway through Kansas. Yeah. Right. And then oop, two days later, we're in South Texas. Right. I mean, the whole thing is it's fascinating. And the things that other people will will come up from the repurposing of this data mm -hmm. with making data more open source, like, you know, our researchers down in Mexico, there could be a grad student in Arkansas that notices something about the birds on this website that, you know, you can collaborate through. And so it can bring, it, it makes it a little more open source where as opposed to very, you know, doing a, you know, a six figure telemetry project, you know, it, it costs a hundred dollars to get this data on our website. Right. And yeah. I mean, that's very open source for, for, that's not a barrier to entry. 
the cool thing about all this is like there's no telling where it's going to be in another year or two. Yeah. You know, like this is the ground floor. Like this is as far as, you know, your mind could take it. But like you said, somebody could see it and you could totally switch gears or add a tweak here and there. And like, there's no telling what this website could look like in another year. So when, eventually we're going to have cameras on these trackers. That would be so much fun. Uh, and, and the technology will get there. Um, at least for a bigger body bird, like a goose or a swan, I think pretty soon. And, and can you imagine if you had a live stream of, of, uh, you know, of a Canada goose in midair mm. flying, mm -hmm. you, you'll have a lot of problems with, with uploading video from something like that, but you can you, like pictures from that are like, some people are starting to do it now. Have you seen the net geo special where they do the birds and they've got cameras on them? Mm. I, I want to say migration is the name of it, but, and it was on Netflix or something, but they had some gray legs and they had actual cameras. Really? And they showed them where they'd land in Europe where they were at. And then it showed one of them landed in some decoys and some guy shot at some of them. It was really interesting. Sounds like now, it might be behind the times. It wasn't a live feed, though. Okay. I'm sure it was one that they captured again and they took the chip out of it and right. stuff. But they had a camera on some birds. I mean, it's – I'm excited for where they're – and there are some smart guys who are doing all that, you know, that technology work there, too. There's no telling where it'll be in a couple of years. I would love to see the live feed camera. That would, that would be really cool. to be upset home and watch and see – Oh my God! Don't go in there. That's they're going to shoot your at. You know that would be. You'd have to put it on a little delay. Cause I, you wouldn't want to put it in coming to a spread. Yeah, exactly. If you right? were yelling at the screen, if you had all of America white, that would alienate you from the hunting community, yeah. even if you were a hunter. Yeah, because here's the one. This we looked at this. Uh, this is a shark that's got a uh, a GoPro on it. I don't know if it's a live feed, but you can go to uh, Atlantic uh, or it's Outcast Sport Fishing, but that's not. It, this one is Atlantic White Shark. Is this the one that was off the Texas coast? Bessie uh, or whatever her name was? Yeah, Lee Beth's camera. Yeah, she's the shark. Um, but, yeah, she's just cruising through the water. Right. Isn't that so cool? Imagine if it was over land. Imagine right. if she was eating a damn shark or a surfer. But this was the uh, Lee Beth. Yeah. So right up there at Venice she right now. Was, she's at Venice. Uh, March 15th, so that's about 10 days ago. Right around Venice. Right around there. Right. And I'll say this too, we were on. Uh, as far as these, these map trackers that, that go online, you, there's a ton of just trolls and people that are super hateful on, on social media and whatnot. Oh. Our, our response to these maps has been overwhelmingly positive um, from, and there are people everywhere that, you know, have their opinion and negative things to say, but it's been, you know, I was told from a, the beginning, don't read comments. And so far yeah. that has not been an issue. Um, I probably jinxed myself <laughs> saying that, but. I bet I could look up. Uh... I was on one the other day, and some anti-hunting lady was bitching and raising hell, and all the people were just giving her a platform to just ignore her ass, and she'll go away. Right. You know, she's just keyboard warrior. Well, and it's probably not even a real person. Also, no, there's, there's a bots. lot of that too. So I circumvented the Instagram not working. I went to your Facebook. So this y'all were he was banning them. That's in Mexico. That's, that's isn't from it? that's from this that's from uh, this December. That's Manuel right there. Um, that's with. Yeah, I'm goes. pretty sure that's a Drake blue wing teal with a tracker on it. Yep, see, it's flying off. And we got a bunch, uh, you know, a bunch of videos, a bunch of cool pictures. Um, oh, cinnamon teal. Mm -hmm. Caught a bunch of cinnamon teal down there. Uh, I think we banded. Man, we banded a lot of birds while we were there. Did y'all find any that were banded already that y'all got? No recaptures. No recaptures on the ducks. I was trying to that's see. It's such an interesting deal, especially for waterfowl hunters. Yeah, you're on what something. A, what a cool deal gonna be a lot of fun to watch this well listen man we've gone two hours now so we appreciate you making the trek from georgia to come to the big honker lodge well we i appreciate, appreciate it. i appreciate the invite it's uh you know it's fun to talk to new people and uh you know to, to have a platform to talk about something i truly love it's it's, it's really fun there's a lot so, of people interested in this had a lot of people at bass classic this weekend talk about it because we had said that you were going to be on here well fantastic well it, you know it it's it's been really fun so far and i, I can't get off of this without you know saying thank you to you know, Jack Miner and to Tira Davis, especially Manuel. Uh, we couldn't have started this without him. Um, I got three guys in Georgia, uh, Terry Johnson, Reggie Thaxton, and Fred Granitz, who are as smart as they come as far as field technicians and wildlife biologists. Uh, the team at Jack Miner is Tom, Joe, and Matt. Uh, all those guys have been just, you know, every step of the way. Super, and my dad, Mike Smith, he's super involved in this as well. Um, you know, it, 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 there's a lot for everything you see that happens. There's 15 things that go on. Oh yeah. hundred percent. That's on everything. How, has it been a pain in the ass getting the app up and going? The, 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 the app we're just starting, um, 
it, it will be. I'm sure. Yes. Yeah. It will Just be. the crossover from like a website to now having an app. Yeah. And on the desktop, like the interface is pretty good at right. this point. And on mobile, it's okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and 98% of web traffic these days is on the phone. Right. And so you have to have a platform that's, that's done with that. And I finally got to the point where I'm convinced it might work. Um, <laughs> and so, so we're, 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 we're working on the app now. And once we get the app up and running, um, I think that'll be a fun next step too. Well, very good. Well, we go from one to the other. We got you on here this today and tomorrow we get to talk about Andy's favorite thing, snakes. Yeah. We got a snake, uh, extractor coming on <laughs> rattlesnakes as long as he uh, doesn't have any in the so truck oh they're bringing s- they're bringing some stuff for us in studio why i don't know keep that shit in the parking lot <laughs> what, what, what do you call a snake catcher what's the name for him i can't think what it is they snake, gonna, snake catcher they're gonna bring a flute and charm them too i mean you gotta you gotta catch his cobras and stuff i'm not no Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> i don't even want to see a garter snake listen Gert, <laughs> seriously thank you for making the trek out here this has been a lot of fun and uh thank you for the for the goodie absolutely we'll keep it right here and uh be a little put it in my shadow box whenever i get around to making it so everybody go to uh 50 ducks right now uh get subscribed because price, price is going price up, gonna go up fall. in the fall so fire sale right now <laughs> join us right now live ducks this fall uh two million data points right now for you to play with i can't wait to see where where you take this in the future so thanks a lot Grim, and uh thank you everybody for listening and love you bye peace watch, watch for deer bye Thank you very much. Two hours of fine.